Recording in progress. All right. It's uh, 6.03 p.m. on July 13th. This is our regular monthly board meeting of the Alameda County Water District. And I would like to turn it over to our general manager just to go through some housekeeping here. Sure. Thank you, President Sethi. Um, on behalf of the ACWD Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome the public's participation in this board meeting. My name is Ed Stevenson, and I serve as the district's general manager. Members of the public may participate in this board meeting in person or remotely by either using the Zoom application or by telephone. Any member of the public present in person who wishes to make comments may approach the speaker's podium at the appropriate time. For those participating remotely, note that the meeting agenda, staff reports, and presentation materials for this meeting are all available on the district's website at acwd.org. You may reference the instructions at the top of the agenda for how to participate using the Zoom controls in the Zoom app or your dial pad if you're participating by telephone audio. This board meeting is being recorded and will be made available to the public for future viewing. And that completes my housekeeping remarks, other than to uh, acknowledge and welcome the staff that are here in support of various items on the agenda, as well as a special guest star this evening, uh, Taryn Rav Ravazzini from the um, Joint Powers Authority for Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project. And we'll hear a little bit more from staff and Ms. Ravazzini a little bit later. Okay, with that, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, would our board secretary please take the roll? Directors Gunther? Here. Akbari? Here. Juan? Here. Weed? Here. And Sethi? Here. And I'm going to call on Mr. O'Bulk to lead us in the salute to the flag, if I may. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, we uh, will entertain public comments. Members of the public may address the board on any issues not listed on the agenda, which are within the purview of the Alameda County Water District. Five-minute limit is customary. However, as board president, I may adjust the actual time allotted to accommodate the number of speakers. Members of the public who wish to address the board on a scheduled item will be given the opportunity to do so when that item comes up. And I want to make sure that if we have any outside attendees, uh, see any? There are no members of the public participating online at this time. Is there any member of the public present in the boardroom who would like to make a comment? Or even an employee? Seeing none, I will close the uh, public comment period and we will move on to the consent calendar and I would entertain a motion to have um, items from the action calendar added to the consent calendar. I would like to move items 5.1 to 5.6. I have a comment um, related to 5.7, but not on the, I mean, it doesn't impact the subject matter specifically, but the topic as a whole. Okay, we'll come back to that. So is that's a motion from Director Weed. Is there a second? A second. Secretary, please take the Director is Gunther? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Juan? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Sethi. Yes. And um, would a director please move for a uh, I'll move the consent calendar as amended. I'll second. Okay, Director Gunther? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Juan? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Sethi? Aye. So on item 5.7, um, well, rather than having it introduced, just let me, I can just in general make my comment of concern about the topic as a whole. Please go ahead. All right. It was noted some time ago by um, former general manager Bob Shaver that the Design for flood control in Alameda Creek had some significant design deficiencies. They put the drop structure too large and too far upstream, resulting in extraordinary sediment. And we've been doing workarounds on it. 
this project has proposed is yet another workaround. It's a shame we cannot address the fundamental problem of greatly reducing the um, total debt uh, drop of the um, drop structure, which would modify the recently uh, completed uh, fish ladder project and would address our concerns at the same time if we raise the base of the stream to the groundwater infiltration impacts of the, um, low, of the, of the work the Corps of Engineers wants to do in Alameda Creek, which is to remove much of the sediment and bring it down closer to our groundwater. So my point being that there is a more fundamental issue of poor engineering, or could have been better engineering, on the drop structure, which have addressed this whole issue and all the money we're spending would have essentially go away. We'd be on to, um, we'd have a, a more appropriate design, we'd have less sediment, and we'd have less expenses to the district, which are going to run into tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Are there, are there, is that the extent of your comments? Yes. Uh, we're still <coughs> doing the modeling and the, the impact of what this current proposal is under this provision, but just re bringing to your attention that there is a more fundamental issue of we're, we're building on bad engineering, and, it can, and that gets to be very expensive over time. May I ask if there's any staff response right now or? Um, just real briefly, maybe um, I'll start, and if anybody would el uh, anybody else would like to just add, I would say um, I think you're right that the uh, the modeling is going to be necessary no matter what happens. Um, and in terms of changes to the channel configuration and so forth, um, we are. And, and by the way, for the public's benefit, we're talking about a army of uh, 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 an, uh, Army Corps of Engineers flood control channel that's operated by another uh, local agency. Um, that we're partners with in terms of um, ensuring that it's that corridor is is used for a number of purposes, including water supply. Uh, and I would say part uh, part of our conversations with um, the Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District involved are there other design approaches that would um, eliminate this problem or minimize it? And so um, so. Uh, a specific solution of removing the drop structure and those sorts of things. Um, uh, I don't know if that if we will end up going there or any other actual design modifications we'll see. But um, the modeling that's proposed here in this item would be needed uh, no matter how you slice it. I, I do not disagree with that description. I would just hope that we at least keep on the table and be the board aware that we're, there's a better way to do this business. I would like to note that there are two members of the public that have joined Kelly Hebrew and uh, <coughs> a district employee, Michelle Walden. <coughs> are there any, is there any feedback from any board members on this issue? Thoughts? And if you don't mind, President Sethi, I've just been informed that one of our attendees is not able to hear us, our remote attendees, so I'd like to just kind of pause for a moment if that's okay. Okay. Apologies for the interruption of folk, those folks that are here. Let me just do a test. Can you hear me now? You can reply in the chat. <laughs> Hi, I note that Mr. Kelly A is one of our remote attendees. And I wonder, Kelly, if you can um, respond and let us know that you can hear us. Uh, I see Kelly indicating he can't hear yet. So we do. Just as is customary and is required, we do need to make sure that we're pausing the, the proceedings until all the members of the public can participate fully. So we'll just, we'll get this result shortly. With that uh, comment, I would move to add 5.7 to the consent calendar. 
Department of Agriculture we've already done the consent calendar is approved. No, no, we, 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 we should hold tight for just a second, okay. Director Weed. I thought we were free of these glitches. <laughs> we've been we've had such a great run of the last several months, but it looks like one found us. We don't have a hacker on this one. <laughs> <laughs> won't point out any sort of correlation between participation between uh, 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 participation of Ms. Ravazzini and uh, uh, whether or not our audio system works properly. I'm sure there's no correlation at all. But it just so happens that it looks like an R squared of like 1.0 right now. Uh, but I'm sure that's not the case. Right. We've restarted the control panel. Are you able to hear us? Put her hand up. Oh. Yeah, it looks like we're okay now. We did lose Mr. Abru. It seems, or Kelly A. Hopefully he'll call back in. All right, well, it looks like we're back online. Uh, again, our apologies for the delay, uh, but I think we can move forward. And we had um, item 5.7 was discussed, hasn't yet been approved. Right, so I'll move we, staff recommendation for item 5.7. Can, can I just ask a question? Of course. Of course. Considering that members of the public couldn't hear the comments mm -hmm. that Director Weed made, do we need to uh, restate some of those comments? Uh, as it stands right now, there are no members of the public uh, online, and our member of the public here heard the comments and the responses. So uh, just a quick question. Were we, even though the, the public couldn't hear us, were we still recording? Yeah. Okay. So since we did lose the member of the public, it's a great point, Director Akbari, but since the member of the public that was here isn't here now, I think we have the uh, comments that are recorded. So I think we could proceed. But that's a great question. If he were here, I would actually agree with you and suggest that we repeat some of that. Okay. Thank you. So... Did we have a motion from Director Weed? I'll move the staff recommendation. Uh, Barry has, uh, I'll, I'll second Director Barry's, Barry's motion to approve the staff recommendation. I made the motion. Okay, I'll step out of it. It's already been moved and seconded. All right. Did you second? I did not second, but I can second that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. right. For the record, we have uh, Director Huang moved and Director Akbari seconded the motion. Yeah. Staff's recommendation. Okay. <clears throat> Director Gunther? Aye. Akbari? Aye. 
Juan? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Sethi? Aye. So we'll move on to item 5.8, authorization of amendment number five to the cost share agreement for Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project Planning. And with this, I'll turn it over to Mr. Stevenson. Okay, yeah, this is, uh, you know, things are moving very quickly. Uh, and we're, this board has been briefed a number of times. We have uh, President Sethi serves on the board of the Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion um, Joint Powers Authority. And so um, uh, we're kind of entering a phase where there's a lot happening. And as the board knows, there'll be a number of additional board briefings really over the next several months as things uh, move along. But this is an important um, inflection point in terms of proceeding with the project. So um, we want to make sure the board's fully informed as to how things are going. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Heidis, our Director of Water Resources. Great. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. We're pleased tonight to have a presentation to share with the board about an update on the Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project. We're going to have a number of different speakers tonight. Um, so uh, just if we go to the next slide, I'll share what we're going to be covering tonight. So the purpose is really to update uh, the board on the activities in advance of a fifth multi-party cost share agreement amendment for planning activities for the project. And we actually have a super short Los Vaqueros um, expansion overview in uh, that we can do. And then I'll be turning it over for the majority of the presentation uh, to Taryn Rabazzini, the executive director of the Los Vaqueros Reservoir JPA, who we're really pleased to have here with us today. Um, to provide an update on those activities of the JPA. And then we'll be turning it back over to staff. Mr. John Wunderlich will kick off our review of preliminary costs and benefits uh, to be followed by uh, Mr. Thomas Neiser on the water resources side. And we'll wrap up with a review of the multi-party cost share agreement amendment number five. So with that, next slide, please. Um, I'll keep this very brief because I think Ms. Uh, Ravazzini is going to cover this in her presentation. This is a brief overview of the uh, reservoir uh, expansion project. There's a number of partners and benefits, and I'll just, I think she's going to cover this. I'm going to skip to the next slide. Just to briefly uh, refresh memories on uh, the district's interest in Los Vaqueros Reservoir as a location adjacent to the state water project. It's south of the Delta, yet upstream of our uh, service area here. It provides emergency and resiliency for any Delta outage that could occur. It has the potential to capture Delta surpluses, could potentially provide more operational flexibility for us along with our state water project operations, and also has the um, potential to facilitate easy transfers to and from uh, uh, water sources from different partners on the project. So with that, I think we will turn it over to Ms. Ravazzini to uh, provide an update on JPA activities. Great, good evening. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Laura, and uh, good evening, um, excuse me, uh, President Sethi and um, members of the Board of Directors, Alameda County Water District. It is really a pleasure for me to be here this, this evening um, as, uh, to present to you an update on the Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project. Um, I'm gonna try and move the slides and talk at the same time, never my greatest skill. Um, as uh, Ms. Heides had mentioned, uh, a general overview I'm happy to provide just as a refresher on the Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project. Uh, but before I dive in, I do just want to acknowledge uh, that I sincerely appreciate the work of Alameda County Water District and the staff who have been very supportive um, since my onboarding as the executive director for the uh, JPA. I came on in September and have worked very closely with the uh, members of your executive staff. And so a lot of this information uh, is information that we've all uh, worked on together and um, just want to acknowledge uh, the top-notch professional group that you have working for you. The um, Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project, um, Los Vaqueros is part of the Surface Storage Program 
from 2000 CalFed Bay Delta program record of decision, that actually puts us in a very unique group of um, in particularly important storage projects for the state of California. We are an authorized state-led project uh, under the WIN Act, which is the federal act, which is providing uh, substantial funding for a Los Vaqueros expansion project. We are also, um, <clears throat> uh, Proposition 1 Water Storage Investment Program Project, and I'll be talking more about that as we go forward. The Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project, represented by the Joint Powers Authority eight-member agency, uh, JPA, is truly a multi-agency collaborative effort. It does have broad state, federal, um, and environmental stakeholder support. The project objectives in particular uh, in, uh, include, excuse me, um, water for wetlands, water for communities. Uh, the uh, service area does cover approximately services for 11 million Californians. The design of the project uh, improves regional integration and, and in fact establishes regional integration for a good portion of uh, the um, communities that are connected here. And the water, it does improve water quality, particularly um, assisting the movement of higher water quality for blending uh, for uh, the member agencies. And the um, Los Vaqueros Reservoir is surrounded by an expansive watershed, and there are a lot of recreation benefits included as well. The project components, I'll just run through those again. Um, there are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I just, I feel like I'm having a mic feedback issue. Is there, are you hearing me clearly? You sound really good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so there are some key components here. The storage, uh, this is an expand, expansion of an existing reservoir. The Los Vaqueros Reservoir, um, as mentioned, is owned and operated by Contra Costa Water District, a key partner in this expansion project. The um, reservoir currently is at 160,000 acre feet. It will be increased by 150,000 acre feet to the total of uh, 275,000 acre feet. There will be some upgrades to existing facilities uh, by of both Contra Costa Water District and another partner, East Bay Municipal Utilities District. We also have conveyance components. There is the Transfer Bethany Pipeline, which is a key project component that will connect water um, to the um, California Aqueduct, and that is of, of keen interest for the Alameda County Water District members. And then we do have, as mentioned, recreational benefits, um, including uh, interpretive center that already exists uh, at the uh, reservoir watershed. There will be an expansion of, uh, of that, uh, movement of an arena and expansion of that and upgrades and many, many trails around the area. So there's a lot of um, tangible community benefit as as well um, to, uh, to the public. The state public benefits identified here, the, the role of um, the Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project is not simply for the region. It really does benefit the state of California as well. And that is where um, our connection to the Proposition 1 Water Storage Investment Program comes in. There are um, high degree of ecosystem benefits um, through the incremental level four water supply for south of Delta wildlife refuges. As we look at the design of the project, the Transfer Bethany Pipeline will help us move water uh, in down to a um, series of wildlife refuges uh, in the uh, general Central Valley area and provide um, a great support for the Pacific Flyway, a really important ecosystems down there. There is a small benefit for improving the survival of salmonids that are migrating through the Delta. The other uh, public benefits defined by the project uh, under the Proposition 1 definitions is emergency response. We will be providing catastrophic and drought emergency support. And then, of course, the uh, recreation I was mentioning earlier. Additional benefits include increased supply reliability. This is not just for Bay Area municipal and industrial, but also south of Delta Central Valley Project agricultural entities. And there are, um, and I'll go through the partnership of the authority and you'll see the, the different interests that are there. The enhanced uh, regional collaboration, again, this is really what makes this project so special, is the unique nature of the 
partners. We are leveraging existing facilities ultimately that go from the Pacific Ocean all down through to um, key portions of the Central Valley. Uh, we will be facilitating water transfers, allowing the uh, member agencies to use within their diversified portfolios to enhance a re regional uh, integration to improve uh, drought, uh, managing transfers in times of uh, drought uh, and improving water uh, regional water supplies. And of course, it does as well connect to the need for climate change resiliency. As I mentioned earlier, there are water quality benefits depending on the member agency. We are really looking at improving drinking water quality. <clears throat> the um, eight member agencies that sit on the Joint Powers Authority Board uh, include the Alameda County Water District, the Contra Costa uh, Count, excuse me, Contra Costa Water District, East Bay Municipal Utilities District, Grassland Water District, SFPUC Valley Water zone seven and San Luis Delta Mendota and San Luis Delta Mendota is representing five of its member agencies and those are listed here on this slide through an activity agreement with the partners. As you can see, this is a very, very unique way of looking at the uh, regional watershed, so to speak. And this is how, what, what is so fascinating, and I'll show you as we uh, move forward. Uh, this is a truly a large expanse to connect the region through, uh, through the conveyance systems. So how this works, water ultimately is pumped into the system from four existing delta intakes. We have three primary through Contra Costa Water District, and we have the Freeport intake um, run by East Bay Mud. Uh, once it is in the system, water will be sent through an upgraded facility, uh, pump station, and then from there, water can be pumped to the Los Vaqueros Reservoir for storage, or then be pumped through down to the Transfer Bethany Pipeline and ultimately connect to the California uh, Aqueduct for delivery to um, South Bay Aqueduct members. Cost and funding of um, keen interest, I'm sure, for the members today. So we are very fortunate that the Los Vaqueros Reservoir has um, great broad support from both state and federal entities. Our state partners, uh, through the California Water Commission, we are eligible for up to $477 million because of the public benefits that the project does provide, as discussed earlier. The federal funding, we have up to 25% cost share authorized in our federal feasibility report from 2020. Uh, currently, to date, we have received $164 million appropriated through from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. And in that, we have um, support through WIN Act funding and also the bipartisan infrastructure law. The local uh, cost share would be approximately $300 million at this point. We are actively pursuing a WIFIA loan through the US EPA. We are um, within a couple of months of sending in that application and then working with uh, EPA to establish a, a negotiate a, a loan agreement. And of course, we are also working on additional financial instruments to provide interim financing. The total development and construction cost at this time of in 2022 dollars is $980 million. So you can see the cost share there that the state um, through the California Water Commission is really providing almost 50% of that funding. So as I continue to talk about Proposition 1, you can see it does hold um, primary interest uh, to this partnership for making sure that we can reach that um, funding goal. As you are considering the multi-party benefit, uh, excuse me, the multi-party cost share uh, agreement <clears throat> today, I wanted to walk through what we're looking at for the next year, fiscal year 24, and what your contribution would be providing. We're in a really critical stage in this year, uh, upcoming year. We are working towards um, establishing the keen investment of each of the member agencies to determine their commitment to the project. That would be um, shown through the execution of service agreement between the Joint Powers Authority and the individual members. That would be the fourth bullet down. I kind of jumped ahead because that is our focus right now as the Joint Powers Authority. There are a lot of moving parts to bring that together. Uh, additionally, then kind of starting up at the top here, 
the Joint Powers Authority has been um, initial was initially um, using Contra Costa Water District as their administrator. They have been um, significant in providing technical and administrative and financial support uh, through their staff. And we now with the Joint Powers Authority. And with the, the onboarding of myself and some other key consultants, we are transitioning those, those responsibilities formally over to the Joint Powers Authority. So as of this new fiscal year, we have, um, with uh, the support of our treasurer at the Joint Powers Authority, President Sethi, uh, we have opened a bank account for the authority. We are, are now um, primed and ready to pay our own uh, invoices here and manage all of that. That is a very important step for this this organization. We are continuing to advance permitting and design projects funding, but key to this next year is negotiating all of the agreements that are critical to getting the members to a place where they can fully uh, determine their business case and invest in the project through the service agreements. And that means not just securing our permits, but also working with the state through the California Water Commission, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Water Resources for um, the contracts that we need to ensure that we will deliver on our public benefits for the state. Uh, we will also be working with the United States Bureau of Reclamation. We currently are. All of this is in real time. We're doing all of this now, but there are a lot of um, a lot of discussions happening. We are still awaiting a record of decision from the Bureau of Reclamation. So we're in um, leadership work groups, uh, excuse me, workshops that we are having monthly with the uh, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation um, regional leadership uh, in order to meet uh, our deadlines to get a record of decision from them uh, and determine for them how they want to engage and invest in the project. So we are, as we look potentially at even securing future, excuse me, more um, federal funding, uh, this is, uh, these are critical. And with that, we will need to um, uh, sign, you know, funding agreements with, with those uh, state and federal partners. And that would also come through our desire to in showcase that we can meet uh, uh, the process of getting uh, public benefits through the project as it's continuing to be designed. And so we are hoping to receive the full amount as conditionally awarded at this time by the California Water Commission. And that is that $477 million mentioned before. We are updating our plan of finance and, and uh, securing interim financing. We are working very, very closely with um, the governor's strike team. This is a, a team pulled together by the um, by Governor Newsom, with uh, the lead being the Secretary for Natural Resources, uh, Mr. Wade Crowfoot, and uh, the department heads of DWR and Fish and Wildlife and the State uh, Water Resources Control Board. This team has been tasked to help move and accelerate the Proposition One projects. The Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project is the project that is next on the docket for the California Water Commission because we are further ahead than many of the other um, projects. Uh, I think they are. There are seven projects. One was just um, one was just approved its final funding award. That was Harvest Water out of uh, Sacramento, and that is a conjunctive use project. Los Vaqueros would be the first storage water storage project to come before the Water Commission. So we're working very closely with them on the schedule uh, to meet uh, to meet a desired goal of getting our final funding award in June of next year, 2024. So we're working very, very closely with a high level of uh, political support on this project. We also have internal agreements, uh, not just with our, our federal and state partners, but internally with our uh, membership. So as I mentioned, we have some facilities that we need to modify, and we're also building new facilities. So with Contra Costa Water District and East Bay Mud, we have several um, significant agreements that also need to be sorted out prior to uh, the service agreement. So this is going to be a very, very busy year, and uh, definitely appreciate, again, the support from the staff here at Alameda County Water District, along with the other um, project members.
This gives you a sense of a lot of the moving parts. We are building the organization uh, while we are trying to move forward and, and meet all of these uh, important milestones. As you can see, there are a handful of agreements on there, but there are also financing components and there is permitting and water rights change petitions still to, still to go. So this gives you just a quick snapshot with the overall target of meeting that California Water Commission award hearing. I wanted to show this to you as um, so uh, we are here today to talk about the multi-party agreement number five. All of the member agencies are currently looking at the MPA, as we call it, uh, to approve that cost share agreement. And these are the dates. Just a note, zone seven for the public, the zone seven date is, I believe, July 19th, not the 18th. It will be at their regularly scheduled uh, board meeting. So the um, Contra Costa Water District and the Joint Powers Authority have both signed the agreement prior to the end of fiscal year 23. So we are all set and um, simply are, um, we're able to move forward with, um, with taking over the budget and, and all of the things that we need to do from the financial standpoint. And now we look forward to receiving the signatures from, from the members. I believe that concludes my portion of the presentation. And I'm, I'm not certain if I take questions at this point or if we wait to the end. I think it's fair game if the board has any particular questions, but recognizing there's going to be additional information to be added uh, by staff. Okay, I see that. Um, first of all, we have um, our member of the public, Kelly A, that rejoined. And uh, the way I'm going to conduct this is that we'll take questions from the board first. I'll ask for public input, and then we'll we'll come back to the, the board. So. Um, Comments from the board or que questions from the board? Okay. <laughs> Let's do questions first. Comments from say the comments. I'll, pr I'll frame the question. <laughs> when I've asked there uh, some years ago, uh, Mr. Brown, Jerry Brown, who I ironically heard speak at lunch today at uh, on sites, indicated there were three options for participation. I've been told by our staff we have until later this year to make a determination on which of the options we would be involved with. Full participation, dedicated storage, Bethany transfer pipeline with some operational storage or the pipeline only. I have not seen, do you have those numbers been broken out to determine what the cost of, would be for uh, participation under those uh, each of those options? Uh, thank you, Director Reed. That's an excellent question. And I, if if I may just um, also thank Jerry Brown for providing insight into Los Vaqueros Reservoir from the expansion project. Um, <clears throat> yes, those are the three ways in which uh, members can participate in the project. We do not have numbers yet because that is exactly what we're working on now with our member agencies. We have work groups that are underway determining allocation methodologies. We are also working on facilities usage agreements with uh, East Bay Mud and Contra Costa Water District also, which impact uh, the funding, I mean, the cost of that. So we are in the throes of doing that and we will be um, working closely with your staff to provide those answers. Okay. Um, been involved in a number of JPAs, over 60 years of elected office. This is the first one, I, based on the draft, I saw the JPA agreement. And the only time I've seen this, that veto authority will be granted to two members of the JPA, East Bay Mud and Contra Costa. Is that the, still the current plan? It's, um, it is part of the Joint Powers Authority Agreement that was executed by all eight of the member agencies. The veto power is very specific for those two agencies who have uh, facilities that are being either um, uh, modified uh, or upgraded and uh, the, the criteria within the executive agreement. And I'm sorry, I can't list off the specific um, details, but the, it is a very uh, kind of precise uh, ability uh, for veto power. The veto power is very specific for certain things. The Bethany transfer pipeline, which I'm strongly supportive of, is designed for an eight foot diameter. I understand it was 300 CFS. 
My understanding is the pump station is designed for 450 CFS. It strikes me that there, I understand there's been a proposal to increase the diameter. There's discussion of increasing the diameter to by even on two feet to be able to handle a 50% increase in capacity, particularly since you're going, to, this now is identified as an emergency um, water supply. What is your understanding of, and the pushback to me came from a uh, board member in Contra Costa, was afraid that with the extra capacity, water might go to Southern California. Um, literally, that was his quote. The, um, so in, what is the opportunity, if any, to discuss an increased diameter for the Bethany transfer pipeline, which would allow it to work and take on to advantage the full capacity of the proposed pump station? So that's an excellent uh, question. And I know there has been a uh, question to that effect over the many, many months wondering, can the Transfer Bethany pipeline capacity be enlarged? I will say that we are confined by the uh, CEQA analysis and the environmental documents that have determined uh, the uh, analysis of 300 CFS. So that is the way that we are moving forward with the project. Uh, the uh, discussion can always happen amongst board members, but at this time, as we move the project forward, we are needing to move forward with uh, the current analysis that is approved. Well, in pushback, I would argue that CEQA does not define the um, definition uh, or does not define the diameter of the pipeline. It's the ability to take the water from one point to another. And note that the record of decision approved in 2004 allowed for a half a million acre foot reservoir, which could have been built for the same cost near the transfer station and was not because again, comments from Contra Costa board members that it would be too large and water might go to Southern California. Um, and that half million acre foot of reservoir could be expanded to 1 million with some satellite. And that was in the original water cons plan concept. <clears throat> And if we were to build a half million acre foot reservoir, we will then remove the reservoir, assuming we remove the dam that we're about to expand. Next question, is it true that Contra Costa and East Bay Mud will not be participating in the expansion of the um, Las Vicaras Reservoir, LV3? They will not, they don't need capacity, therefore they will not be financially participating in the raise of, in the, in the, in the cost of raising the uh, elevation of the, of the dam. So maybe I can take this in two parts because there was an, if I could address um, Contra Costa Water District as owner and operator at this time, uh, is not anticipating using the additional storage for which the 115,000 acre feet um, would be invested in by the, the member agencies. So as we look at that 115,000 acre feet, it would be, um, it's amongst the other seven members to consider how they want to um, manage and allocate that storage space. I if I may uh, make one clarification for an earlier comment about water getting to Southern California. Um, within the Joint Powers Authority Agreement, it is clearly stated that it's the member agencies of the JPA to whom we'll be benefiting uh, from the project. So the water is confined to those member agencies. Even in an emergency situation? Well, I will say that there can always be a major executive decree coming from on high that could alter uh, my answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that the way that the Joint Powers Authority, uh, with all of its members, they have approved uh, working within their service areas, that's the space for which that water and those benefits would be used. <clears throat> okay, and then I also understand that Westlands is going to receive about 43,000 acre feet of this water. Uh, that their requirement is 2,500 TDS, much lower water quality. Has there been any thought or discussion of finding them an alternate water supply within the within their their needs for their bird sanctuary 
and allowing 43,000 acre feet of state water quality water to be used by other members or entities. If I may, I think you're referencing Grassland Water District. Westland, sure. Not Westland Water District, but Grassland Water District. Grasslands, I'm sorry, yes, Grasslands. just to I'm clarify. Sorry. I, I, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, and because the um, the uh, large amount of thousands of acre feet that you mentioned, that is defined as the public benefit for the wildlife refuges, which would be provided the um, management of uh, by Grassland Water District. I <clears throat> have to say there is a possibility of entering into uh, some exchange agreements uh, in terms of considering water quality uh, with uh, that which gets to grass and water district at this time, or which hasn't happened yet, so I just need to clarify. So in answering this, um, the water quality uh, question that you raise is, I believe, one for the members. And so the members can work through um, with Grassland and others managing uh, if they want to exchange um, water and, and yet the system does not allow for a lot of the um, exchanges that might be necessary to do that. It's not actually quite designed for the ease of that yet. Um, so it is something the, um, right now the refuges do rely on uh, a mix of different water sources. Uh, so there would really need to be discussions with Grassland Water District on this. I honestly cannot speak to that specifically, but just in terms of the structure of the project, it, it does not quite work yet, so it would there would need to be more discussion. There are currently proposals to expand um, the San Luis Reservoir with additional mm -hmm. capacity. Might that be put into the calculations to allow, because San Luis can work with the grasslands to meet their water supply requirements, that the additional storage at San Luis, when put into the equation, may well allow us the ability to look into some flexibility and exchange programs that would provide other water sources in the valley, which may be agricultural runoff, that meet the requirements of the uh, bird sanctuary, which is water quality of one-tenth that of what will be coming from uh, your project. So bring those out as uh, general thoughts. Um, Be interesting. Uh, I, I can go into more detail on this, but uh, again, I'm glad to see that the, as I understand, we don't have the timelines here, but the Bethany Transfer Pipeline will be built first and will be completed as early as 2026. The timeline for uh, construction um, will be shifted a little bit because we are about a year. Uh, we're needing to um, push out construction based on uh, the fact that we have not signed the service agreements yet. So until we have that locked in, uh, that does affect uh, our receipt of construction dollars, which would be coming from the state. And so upon uh, the service agreements getting signed and receipt of those construction dollars, then we can begin construction. So it would just be, sorry for that long intro, but the, um, the, design, the way that the construction cadence would go uh, the first thing, in fact, to be um, constructed would be pupping plant number one, because that's higher up in the system. So we need to get all of those modified in advance. But of the two major components, the dam expansion versus the, Beth the transfer Bethany pipeline, the transfer pipeline will be, um, would, will be constructed prior to the dam expansion. So the design ultimately would be so that we can our, begin accessing uh, and move the water as needed for the members. That's the goal. Um, but I will say that <clears throat> this is all contingent upon uh, the JPA members uh, determining whether they are um, they have a business case to engage in this project and uh, to keep the the regional partnership together. And upon the execution of that service agreement, then um, we will be ready to go. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Questions from Director Wong? Nothing from me. Thank you. Questions from Director Akbari? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Ravazzini, for, for uh, joining us today. Uh, my question is, um, I, I think you kind of touched on, on water quality, but you did mention that there, through this project, there would be major improvements to drinking water quality. Can you 
just summarize what the benefits we could expect. So the the comment about water quality, uh, I will say that the water quality is based on the fact that we will be um, moving uh, and exchanging water in order to make the project work for all members. So we have the opportunity of getting some higher quality water to places where it normally wasn't. So blending, uh, improving the blending of certain sources. That's my understanding of, of how the overall water quality improvement. Uh, we have not pursued water quality as a public benefit under the water storage investment program criteria. So that is not... Um, that's that's one reason why I'm not emphasizing that under the proposition one dollars, um, and I I will need to get more information on more specifics of of water quality improvements. But overall, the the design is that with the way that the different partners are moving the water, we have the ability through the different intakes to manage and improve uh, water quality uh, to get to the to the source. Thank you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. Uh... I think that the way the reservoir is currently operated, it's based on seasonal patterns in the Delta. And so Contra Costa tries to avoid um, high salinity water and take big gulps of low salinity water. This will allow us to take those big gulps more often when the water quality in the Delta is um, of lower salinity. That's me, the primary benefit. Yes. And and to build on uh, one point that Director Weed was making about Grasslands Water District, um, there should be opportunities for them to take or accept higher TDS in, in the water that's coming down to the refuges. They don't need the cleanest water uh, down there. So we need to think about allocation in that, in that vein. Director Gunther. Well, first, I support this. Um, obviously, we haven't got to a budgetary um, issue yet. Um, support working together, how you solve problems. So um, I'm sitting, I'm staying back, seeing what you got to offer. Yeah, I do support it. and definitely support the transfer pipeline. But that is a priority. So I have a couple of uh, questions and comments. First is, um, we had a day long set of meetings with our California legislators and with the governor's office um, to address the fact that Prop 1 was passed in 2014 total of seven and a half billion, of which 2.7 was allocated for surface storage and groundwater storage projects. And sites and Los Vaqueros are the two largest awards right now. And we were made these awards in 2015 dollars, but we're not putting shovels to the ground until next year on LVE and then late 2025 on sites. So the request has been for an inflation adjustment in the original award of dollars. Where do we stand on that? I don't even think we've heard back at our LVE board meeting what the status is. And do you know that there is strong interest from um, the governor and the legislature for uh, in the inflation boost for the um, Prop One projects? Uh, the governor did just. Um, Pass the this large infrastructure project um, bill, but the uh, inflation amount is not clearly marked yet. So we have not um, received notification of an Im increase in the California Water Commission Proposition One recipient um, amounts at this time. There was um, in the 2025. Uh, fiscal year 2025 budget, uh, approximately $500 million uh, intended for the Proposition 1 uh, projects. And that was what we did walk around the legislature uh, to communicate that we'd appreciate advancing those, those dollars. And um, we have not uh, received word yet uh, that that will be done. 
Second is um, we passed a resolution yesterday in in favor of Diane Feinstein, Senator Feinstein's Stream Act. And since we have qualified for WIFIA funding and um, WIN Act money, uh, this would be supplemental funding that could be provided on an expedited basis. So um, under my own director's comments later tonight, I'm going to make a request that we uh, try to support the same uh, bill that's going through Congress right now. But turning to another subject, um, on the uh, diameter of the Transfer Bethany pipeline. So I brought up the questions in the past, as you know, about whether it was possible to increase, why and why not, what's the capability of the pumps north of the pipeline. <clears throat> and so I felt I got a satisfactory answer back and also from Steve Ritchie, who took the look, look at this from San Francisco, that if you're running 300 CFS, 300 feet, cubic feet per second, and you use the translation formula, that's 200 million gallons of water per day. And who's gonna be using that much water per day? And if you need to go from 300 up to 450, well then you've got 300 million uh, MGD available. And my understanding based on talking to the chief engineer at Contra Costa, Chris Hines, was that that extra capacity was built in for so-called emergency situations, which would most likely be major earthquake on the Hayward Fault that inundates the Delta with seawater, um, some other saltwater catastrophe. And we need to get water right away down to uh, Zone 7, Santa Clara, ACWD, as well as bypass the pumps, the, the state and federal pumps to pump water down into the Central Valley. They can't irrigate crops with salt water. So um, my own opinion is after asking a lot of questions and talking to the engineers is that we have sufficient capacity and we're already working on the design is in progress. This is one of the early elements of the, of the project. So uh, last thing is um, we're in a situation where we have oversubscription for the available 115,000 acre feet. And last I heard we are somewhere around 160,000 acre feet of water being requested. Mm -hmm. How do we expect to resolve that right now? Uh, my question, you've heard me state it before in our onboard meetings. I hope that there's some proportionate um, allocation that one, there's no one big winner and, and a loser in trying to come up with sorting out the allocation. So where do you view us going from here? Thank you. That's an important question. Um, when we think about California water today, it's not a surprise that 115,000 acre feet uh, does, is not enough to suffice the demand that we, we currently have. So of the, of the member agencies right now, there's about 165,000 acre feet of want uh, for the expansion at this time. So we're looking at uh, the need to work with all of the member agencies to figure this allocation methodology out together. This is not something that the JPA can simply go in and surgically say, this is what you get, this is what you get. We are providing tools, uh, technical support to the member agencies. We've been, um, our staff have been meeting with individual, with each member agency uh, to talk through what is the uh, desired amount, what are the amounts that can still maintain their business case, uh, we are, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work going on literally right now. We just had a multi-hour meeting yesterday, uh, walking through potential methodology. Uh, Thomas uh, Nieser will probably be able to touch on that as, as needed in his presentation, but the partners do uh, expect to kind of working um, with us to kind of firm up their desired demand. There will be no grand decider 
If I need to lock the member agencies in a room with a mediator, I will do that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm getting a sense that that might need to happen, but I'm going to give it several more months of, of time for us all to work together. We're running different models. We're, pro again, providing different tool sets uh, to help members determine uh, their, their best uh, business case and to help facilitate the discussion uh, for resolving this. But again, the JPA is not in a position to mandate that. So it is to facilitate what the membership can can do together. So uh, this this does take um, this does take a degree of um, patience and commitment to the regional partnership. And I think that's part of what we're we're seeing now. Yeah, and just to build on that, I think we need to appreciate and understand that some of us are only looking for emergency storage. That's the primary benefit for ACWD. It's not a continuous need. Um, we would look for this during a deep drought where we need a reliable source of water. Um, and we saw what happened not in this past drought, but the one before it when we got down to a zero allocation on the state water project. Although we are we have a lot of water bank down in Kern County at Semi-Tropic, we couldn't retrieve any of the water because there was nothing coming through the system. And with this project, we can circumvent um, and bring water down through uh, from the transfer pipeline down to the South Bay Aqueduct. So that would relieve a lot of pressure during a, a significant drought. For other agencies, however, they are going to have a year round or maybe six to nine months of demand for, for water. Um, and so we have to balance all that out. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you one last question because even although I'm a board member on the other board, I it's not even clear to me what the storage opportunities would be to send water from Los Vaqueros down to San Luis Reservoir and bank it away there for the south of Delta folks. Is there that opportunity through reclamation? I'm, I'm sorry, could you, I'm trying to make sure I understand your question to use our well, facilities to then- Reclamation is going to have a certain amount of footprint in the reservoir, right? Uh, not necessarily. So those are part of the conversations that we are currently having with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and to determine uh, their uh, benefit out of the project. We are looking at um, some um, operational flexibility for the Central Valley project. It may or may not uh, indicate storage. Well, I'm sure they're not putting in a big chunk of investment here in, into the project to, to get nothing back. Yeah. Well, again, storage becomes a question that is not necessarily where Bureau of Reclamation it needs. It's more around the operational flexibility that the conveyance system could provide uh, for uh, for their meeting their um, well, let me, our member agency let me contracts. Ask my question, just very generally, can water go from Los Vaqueros to um, San Luis Reservoir for storage? Uh, we can get water to the California aqueduct uh, that will then go to the South Bay aqueduct. Um, so from the California aqueduct, the if there is a the inner tie, I I just I'm sorry I'm not the um, I'm not I'm afraid I'm not going to answer this properly. So I may have to circle back with you. My apologies for for that. That's okay. I will bring it up at our next meeting. Thank you. APA. Thank you. I don't want to I don't want to connect. Uh, major aqueducts without there properly being a, a physical opportunity to do that. So, well, I'm, I'm in my mind, if we can get around the state and federal pumps, which. Well, uh, by I'll getting to the either. California aqueduct, then you have the inner ties that connect to the Central Valley project. So we are, um, we do have that ability and that is something that we're working with. I think how the project operates still goes to your question and we are currently working on on all of that well if we expand san luis reservoir 
I would think that there we should be looking at that opportunity. That that's just an opinion, okay, for what it's worth. Well, and our 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 San Luis Delta Mendota member agencies uh, do have uh, an interest in obviously trying to make that work as well. Okay, so that suffices my questions. I would like to ask if there are any questions or comments from members of the public, and I see one. Kelly A, would you like to go ahead? All right. Um, yeah, I'm. Um, I'm looking at at, the, at these numbers. I'm mainly look at uh, the uh, annual cost, the uh, total, uh, the uh, present value of the capital cost, the, the uh, and comparing them with the estimates that were put before the board of directors of the Zone Seven Water Agency in Livermore. Now, on slide sixteen. That's the slide number 16 here today. There's something about $51.7 million per year, which is an outrageous number. And I think that that's like a typo. It says annual costs, and then it says $51.7 million. That's got to be wrong. That's got to be the total cost, present value of the total cost. And then the annual cost, another annual cost, $3.3 million. That's how, you know, if now you compare that with uh, zone, now your, talking about having 9,000 acres. Mr. 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 Abreu, yeah. um, as the presiding officer here, I w would appreciate it if you would address where we are to this point in the current part of our presentation. We still have more to come here. And if you can reserve your comments until the entire board and the rest of our audience has seen that material, that would be very helpful. Could I ask for your cooperation on that? Well, I'm looking at your slide that you just presented, or that's on your in your packet. Fifty-one point seven million dollars per year. Slide sixteen, number sixteen. It says down there, Mr. Um, Abreu. Mr. Abreu, it has not been presented yet. Please oh. let us get there. Oh, it hasn't been. All right, fine. Uh, then, if we look at the total amount of storage, nine thousand acre feet. Now, when Zone Seven looks at the total amount of storage, they talk about up to. 10,000 acre feet, and they make it clear that, that that's not a guaranteed number. So I suspect that the 9,000 is not a guaranteed number, and it's up to 9,000. Mr. Abram, again, I'm going to have to cut you off. We're not there yet in our presentation. Please let us review that as a board and a public here. And well, how we about will the welcome South Bay Aqueduct? Transferring water from the South Bay Aqueduct to reach to uh, Valley Water or ACWD. If the water is going through that pipeline, um, I haven't seen any uh, any work or any any upgrades, kind of like what Hetch Hetchy did at the Calaveras and Hayward Fault. So I kind of doubt the uh, the earthquake resilience of the South Bay Aqueduct when it crosses over those two faults. And um, uh, let's see. So yeah, what I'm looking for here from 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 the uh, 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 presenter or from your slides is. You know, annual costs is operational maintenance cost is present value costs, all these kind of, you know, costs, then how much water are you getting, then what is the what transfer Bethany capacity and schedule um, transfer Bethany uh, 300 CFS obviously nobody's going to be getting 300 CFS so uh, well maybe they will momentarily but uh, instantaneously but as, on a long term average and annual average, you're never going to get that much water. So who's getting that water and when and why, why how and why? Um, you know, it's it's very unclear that uh, you know who has who has the rights and how this stuff is being divided up. And then the three hundred million dollars that we just saw, uh, where that All was right, Mr. Local... Abreu, uh, Mr. Abreu, I'm going to ask you to let us move forward with our presentation, and I will welcome you back after we've gotten through the entire presentation because you're speaking to subject material that has not been presented yet, either to the board or the public. So um, if I have to, I will cut you off uh, she on had the a microphone. Pie, but didn't, wasn't there a pie chart with a, three, with a local share of $300 million? Um, so, you know, how is that yeah. gonna be divided up among the seven agencies? Yeah. Thanks. We're gonna get to it, please. Indulge us for a few minutes, okay? I'm gonna ask, yeah, but not broken down yet. That's just the general pie chart. So Ms. Hydes, 
Could you, we move forward with the presentation? Yes, absolutely. Um, Director Sathy, we can. Uh, We're Sathy, going. I'd like to one quick clarification. When I spoke with Jerry Brown, it was in his capacity as general manager of Contra Costa. Thank you. Conversation today we did not <laughs> do that at all. Okay. Ms. Itis. Well, we will go ahead and transition here momentarily to our cost and benefit analysis, which the board has seen before, and we're going to be reviewing it and providing a few uh, minor updates. Um, and I also would just note, Director Sessi, to your question about connectedness of systems, um, that's one thing um, that we've been thinking about a lot is our ability to use Los Vaqueros uh, in concert with our state water project supplies and the various facilities there. So as we go through some of the um, presentation, Maybe we'll we'll keep that in mind and add a little flavor around what we have uh, thought of creatively on how to how to use that system and how that may benefit us. So I will turn it over first to uh, my colleague here, John Wunderlich, to kick off the finance portion. So thank you, uh, Ms. Ravazzini, for that presentation. We'll probably invite you back for some more questions. <laughs> All right, well, good evening all. I'll kick off our own internal analysis, and then uh, the bulk of this will be presented by uh, Mr. Nizer, our water supply and planning manager. Uh, and so finance and water resources staff have been working together to look at the estimated costs and benefits of this uh, project. All content, and I must uh, stress the underlying bullet point, all content of this presentation from here on out uh, reflects critical inputs that are subject to change. Uh, as our member of the public, Mr. Brew, is noting, um, you know, we still need to determine what our actual storage allocation will be. Uh, we still need updated cost estimates. There, there are many factors that could change. And so really at this stage, uh, we are doing an analysis based on the best information we have today to determine whether it makes sense to continue our current participation in this project but we are not making a presentation tonight that would justify a permanent commitment to this project, but rather whether we want to stay in and continue our participation for another year through multi-party agreement number five. Uh, next slide. So we have five basic costs that are included uh, in the presentation uh, provided this evening. There is our share of fixed costs for new storage and conveyance facilities. So that's the expanded dam, Transfer Bethany pipeline, uh, and some other conveyance facilities. So, you know, our estimated share of those costs, the operating costs uh, to convey that water. So primarily we're talking about electricity, uh, usage fees. So uh, Ms. Ravazzini talked about four intakes to bring water from the Delta into Los Vaqueros Reservoir. Three of those are currently owned and operated in a part of the conveyance system of the Contra Costa Water District. One is uh, was built and owned and part of the system of the East Bay Municipal Utility District. So if we're going to use their facilities, then of course they expect compensation for our use of their facilities. And that's what's referred to with the usage fees. Uh, administrative costs of the JPA are factored in as well as an amortization of pre-2030 costs. So 2030 is kind of the assumed date of when we'll be able to start uh, delivering water through the project, when we're going to start making debt service payments and so on. Uh, but there is money that will be spent between now and then, and so we did not want to exclude uh, those costs from our overall business case analysis. All right, next slide. Uh, so some of the uh, primary reasons why our estimates may may need to change. Uh, first is that uh, cost estimates for the new facilities are preliminary. Uh, we still expect updated, more detailed estimates before we would consider a long-term commitment to the project. Again, we continue to negotiate key agreements uh, that would determine our actual allocation of capacity to the different facilities, as well as the cost allocation methodologies including the methodology for usage fees. And of course, um, we may on our own elect to change our uh, the nature of our participation, which would change our costs. And so um, that's where it becomes really key that we uh, stay really engaged working through with the other member agencies to negotiate the service agreements and facility usage agreements, because those are the agreements that will really set the terms 
for how much of these details will work that will then allow us to finalize our business case. And so with that lead in, I will turn it over to Mr. Neiser to walk us through uh, the details. Is this still on? Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> so as John said, there's not much new information in here. So um, not our preference, of course, but we're basically sort of reproducing um, presentation materials from two years ago. Remember, it was a very hot, sweltery COVID day. I was doing this from my bedroom, <laughs> sweating without air conditioning. Uh, uh, so we're back in office. Things are better. Uh, great. So what has changed? Um, we could, I'm sorry. Um, right. So the water resources benefits of Los Vaqueros have not been substanti substantively substantively updated since that board meeting. Our past analyses uh, at that time were, as John just said, there's a lot of uncertainty in front of us. The pathway is, you know, from horizon to horizon. It's getting a little narrow every step. It was wider back then. So with all of our water supply analyses at that time, we always take a very conservative approach and only count on the things that we can say with some definitive, confident, uh, you know, certitude. Sorry to repeat myself with three synonyms there, but we that's that's the ACWD way. We don't like to go out with speculative thinking. We like to have some confidence in what we're saying. And my point there is that um, with those confident assumptions, the reason we do that is that way, if we err, we're going to err in our benefit. And the long and short is our analysis showed that this investment probably makes sense as we'll get to uh, with the numbers ahead of you. So we do have some updates of things that will affect conclusions from this previous analysis. And I'll, I'll hit on a few of those as we go through it. But otherwise, this is the exact same conclusions from August of 2021. Uh, next slide, please. So the JPA, this is one significant difference, is that the JPA is now the lead role in supporting analyses. As, as Taryn shared, we have a consultant and a team now working through the JP instead of Contra Costa Water District, uh, and that's a positive improvement. Um, there's some transition going on, um, and um, you know it's like an airplane getting off the ground. It's a little wobbly, but we're getting ahead of steam going and getting a smoother flight path in front of us. So we're working with new members, and we're working with uh, some new tools to get through this analysis. Um, as John mentioned, this capacity sharing and other operating constraints are still under discussion, and, and these are going to have a huge effect on our business case. Um, and I appreciate, you know, John pointed out, we don't even know whether the, this will make things more beneficial or worse uh, cost-wise. So there's a, a lot to be determined. Uh, we are working on a new water supply man, uh, a model the board is uh, aware of. In fact, next month we'll be coming in with some details about next steps with that. That's to support the IRP update, our water supply master plan update. That is being developed with a more robust LVE analytic component than we have today. And in my humble opinion, maybe superior to what the JPA is currently using, but we will happily discuss that down the road. Um, so... We're developing that, though, for the purpose of supporting the ongoing negotiations. There's a lot of things in the air. We want to have an ability to rapidly assess and with some higher confidence. And so that's what we're working on. Uh, we are currently in discussions with Zone 7 staff about uh, actually cost sharing on this effort, as well as having some additional representation in the work group so we can have consistent modeling assumptions, have confidence in each other's analyses, as well as do a little cost sharing in the process. Um, and that wouldn't be new for our agencies, by the way. Um, so one positive development is that Department of Water Resources has confirmed ACWD's planned use of LVE for how to capture Article 21 surpluses. I'm not going to go into those details because it's a long and involved and complex process, but we wrote it up in detail with DWR. They confirmed that it's consistent with the contract and is not speculative on our part. This was a big uncertainty of how do you work within the contract rules so that's a big improvement for us. Um, but with every positive, there's always a negative, right? And the, the big negative since 2021 is that our understanding of the future reliability of the San Francisco Public Utility Commission supply has been diminished quite a bit due to the supplemental environmental documentation. Um, that was anticipated, but the bottom line here is that we have to revisit all this modeling. 
Uh, so I'm really just going to go through the old stuff, and we're going to talk pluses and minuses, what we can say is up and what's down, and sort of work off of past work. Um, next slide, please. So this slide is just to remind folks of uh, one thing, really. This 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 is what's in it for ACWD. What are the sort of identified benefits of Los Vaqueros that we've taken since 2012, 2013, when we started? We revisited this topic with Contra Costa. Uh, the the column down the left side are the the uh, benefits which were presented earlier in the presentation. Taryn hit those as well. Um, these are, and we say LVE, these are all positives. Uh, I'm only including this slide because I want to remind the board that we've had the discussions about what about conveyance only without storage. Just including this from the 2021 presentation really is a reminder that we're not actively considering the transfer Bethany only option. Um, we're just putting it back in here to remind folks that our previous analysis showed that it's really, it's all cost and no benefit for ACWD is really the conclusion from that past study. So we just wanted to have it here for the record. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some questions about that, but we can come back to them later. Uh, next slide, please. So as a reminder, the analysis that we did was based on our recently published 2020 UWMP. So the demand assumption as well as the water supply assumptions, as well as demand assumptions are from that. Uh, supply assumptions have since changed. We've lost San Francisco reliability, or projected to. Uh, and as a reminder, our critical demand build out assumption is this final 2050 A bag numbers. These numbers we consider to be quite a bit further into the future than 2050, but we lumped them into our plan so we can have a real stress case. So these are pretty high demands compared to what we really expect to be seeing over the next 30 years. Um, under the future with Los Vaqueros, the sort of key differences here are that. Uh, with confirmation from Department of Water Resources, uh, we are capturing additional Article 21, so new water supply. So that's one of the benefits. Um, and then on the costs side of things, we do reflect that if we're going to go heavy on surface water imports into the future, we are probably going to need treatment plant number one. So as a reminder, our costing is assuming the return of that plant. Uh, I believe it's a, it was a $40 million uh, assumption. This is in 2020 dollars. So there's an extra cost. We've got the cost of LVE plus the cost to bring back TP1. Okay, next slide, please. So just hitting the highlights of, um, see if I can use the laser center beam right now. Um, here we go. Uh, we see in our, excuse me, the uh, single critical year shortages that we saw in our urban plan on the order of about 15%. These numbers are going to be higher now with that lost San Francisco supply. Um, we saw incremental improvement in that if we were to have the Los Vaqueros. But the major benefits that we're seeing are um, resilience. As we know, uh, our system is very uh, vulnerable to a delta disruption, which is going to be exacerbated moving forward with sea level rise, climate change impacts. Uh, one of the huge benefits, of course, is the ability to get water in a delta disruption. So that's a huge improvement. Um, existing uh, assets, we do see a sort of suboptimal use of our existing assets. If, if we were not to proceed with LVE, what does that mean? Remember, we're losing state water supply rapidly. We used to be at a 70% long-term reliability, 75% of full contract on average. Now we're down to 48%. Who knows what the additional climate change is really going to do to that. So what we have is a lot of assets, SBA capacity, treatment capacity that's been in semi-tropic program that's all been built around higher availability of Delta supply. We're losing that. LVE basically helps us just rebuild that place where we are looking to be impacted moving into the future. And since everything's been built around that assumption of higher reliability from the Delta, LVE naturally has a lot of existing assets that we've built that are ready to go. The concern that if we lose our state supply and we are to pursue alternative water supplies, such as bay desalination or IPR for groundwater recharge, is that our distribution system now needs to be modified to address the lack of surface water. So if we don't have some enhancements to our surface water, we're going to have to do a lot of distribution distribution system enhancements. And, and worse is that we're going to have all this idle capacity in the South Bay Aqueduct. 
Um, Semi-tropic is going to be a much bigger storage bank than we need. We can obviously look for liquidation of assets like that, but certainly not the South Bay Aqueduct, uh, treatment plant number two, et cetera. So there's a cost component consideration there that is a benefit of Los Viqueros. Um, next slide, please. But the, the big ones here are the operational, um, uh, other operational elements. Um, without that LV, uh, we need additional upper zone boosting and storage. These are big cost items that are not factored in right now. Uh, and last is the uh, distribution system water quality. As we move into the future, we're expecting to see less state water. That means we're going to have to use more of our use it or lose it San Francisco contract. And this was one of the big undesirable impacts that we're seeing right now without a project like LV. Not a total solution, as you'll see in a moment. But what we're going to see is the need to just take a lot of San Francisco water for the sake of wet water. And we have a vast water quality and consistency in our distribution system whereby we actually look a little bit 1990, where Warm Springs area is going to be heavily direct takeoffs from San Francisco and Union City is going to be back to more blended. And we're just going to see a lot more variation through our distribution system, which is what the 1995 IRP tried to build more parity around. So uh, one way or the other, we're still looking at buying a lot more San Francisco and, and maybe have to make investments in how we use that. Um, slide, please. Uh, this slide was from that past presentation. Uh, the highlights here, there's a lot going on here, and I don't want to get lost in it, but um, the, the blue bars represent, um, this is our current usage of San Francisco. The blue bar represents how much we take to blending, where we have a nice, consistent 150 ppm, currently less hardness. Um, uh, out of that blender facility. And the red represents the times when we need to take San Francisco directly into our system. That's when we have treatment plant outages or we have a distribution hiccup. As we move into the future, our baseline modeling from the urban plan shows that we really need to just take a whole ton of San Francisco supply directly into the system year round. And that the, the ratio there is, is not great. It's just a, in terms of a water quality ratio that's being experienced by our customers in the distribution system. It's a good problem to have. I'd rather have disparate water quality of high quality drinking water than no water at all. Um, but it's something that this district has invested tremendously in undoing. And this is seeing a reversal. The LVE scenario, we still see a lot of San Francisco direct usage there, um, but you can see a, a big drop there. And just pointing out the raw water cost difference uh, in purchases from San Francisco are about six million bucks a year savings if we have the LV that goes into our bottom line calculus on what the benefits of Los Vaqueros are. And remind folks these are in 2020 dollars. Next slide, please. And I think we heard some comments about this slide. I'll get through this slide and maybe we can address them afterwards. I did see that the language is maybe a little uh, misleading. Uh, so again, this is $20, $20, and this is an analysis from a few years ago, but the bottom line conclusions we saw from the study at that time were um, a future without LV, we have no water supply benefit from LV, that makes sense. Uh, and if we were to exercise LV with Article 21 capture, we see ability to capture about 1,600 acre feet a year on average. What does that look like? It's some years with big captures and a lot of years with zero, but using the semi-tropic bank and using uh, I like to think of LV as like a capacitor. If you know your electronics, it builds up a charge and then it'll discharge down to semi-tropic. That's kind of how we're looking at it. Um, so 1,600 acre feet a year on average. The costs associated with this, and I hope Mr. Brew is online. Um, so this, uh, we, we look at bottom line operational cost as well as the project cost. So what we're seeing in here when it says uh, annual costs, we have project only. At that time, we were looking at an annual cost uh, for participation of $3.3 million per year for LV. I don't know if that's the current number. I think it's probably morphed a touch. Uh, but um, we have to look at our whole system. We have a very complex system and reoperation when you bring in that new supply and operation. What does it mean for the bottom line? We're bringing in this supply so that we can avoid some more expensive operations. Our combined operating costs, so this is 
the purchase of raw water, the treatment of water and the distribution of that water, including power, chemicals, everything, um, plus the project costs for LV are represented on this line, um, which I realize online folks cannot see. Marion, would, would you mind with the, the uh, what do you call it, the cursor there, highlighting this line? Thank you. Um, this line here represents by these scenarios, our bottom line operating costs, our variable operating cost, plus the project specific capitalization for LVE. So whereas we see a future operating cost without LVE, we're looking at our variable operating costs of 54 to $57 million a year in 2020 dollars. And if we add in LV, even though we are, we are capitalizing $3.3 million per year, we are able to save, as you saw previously, $6 million in San Francisco purchases. And when we factor in some of the other power and other chemical savings, our bottom line operating cost plus capitalization is about $51 million. So there's a several million dollar per year saving by participating in LVE based on the analysis we did at that time. I'll skip over the other details about climate readiness and the other benefits. I think we just kind of wanted to stay with the fundamentals of is there was there a business case to proceed with this? And our analysis said previously, yeah. Now I'm not going to say that the savings of three million dollars is insignificant, but in context, it's a small percentage. Uh, it's not a huge uh, savings, but it is a savings rather than a cost, and and that's good. Mr. So, Neiser, can yes, I ask sir. a quick question? Does this include the cost of recommissioning TP1? Yes, yes it does. Uh, and the uh, without LVE includes a small cost, I think we assumed one or $2 million for distribution system enhancements. Um, th they would be significantly higher in reality. Uh, we wanted to throw something in there because the truth is without TP1, our upper distribution system is going to need some attention eventually. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, next slide. So our conclusions, uh, again, from 2021, is that LVE storage and conveyance does result in an estimated net reduction in future operating costs. At that time, we estimated 2.6 to $5.5 million. Uh, we see improved offsite reserves and semi-tropic in our modeling. Uh, we're able to keep a healthy supply there to get through long-term critical droughts. Uh, and then, of course, we have the uncosted benefits, which really brought us to the table. You know, the, the Delta uncertainty we have. A, it's an it's insurance policy. Uh, and there's this extra flexibility. We call it future flex is the term we've been using with the board. Um, you know, the one thing we've been learning by going through these droughts recently is having more flexibility, more adaptability is good. Uh, and this gives us a lot more flexibility that we currently do not have. We got a lot now. This is addressing some areas that we don't have. Uh, and a big one is that opening new partnerships and opportunities with those other water agencies, as we discussed. We're not assuming the benefit of transfers in here, but that's what that third button is. The times we've looked at opportunities to do transfers, if you have water commingled, it's going to speed things up dramatically. Right now, we're trying to figure out what to do with some reserves this year. It's a lot of paperwork to find a new place to park it. If we had LV, this is a poster child year for where we would be very happy to have LVE. We've got a lot of surface water that we got to find some place to put. Um, as a reminder, none of these conclusions apply to the LVE conveyance only. Why? Because we can't take advantage of surpluses or Article 21 without storage. Storage is critical for taking advantage of surpluses. So our conclusion is that LVE appears to remain a good investment for ACWD, and it appears to warrant continued participation. Feels like a skip in record. That was from 2021, but that remains the conclusion of the technical analysis. Granted, we do have to revise our baseline modeling around the San Francisco availability. So that's the end of the water supply review. Thank Should you I... very much, Mr. Neiser. When, if the uh, board is up, up for it, we have just a couple more quick slides on the multi-party agreement. So with that conclusion that uh, look, appears to remain a good investment, staff is also bringing to the board tonight a recommendation related to multi-party cost share agreement amendment number five. Uh, this continues funding for planning and design activities through the current fiscal year. Um, and you heard 
that's uh, some of what is going to be happening this year earlier in, in Ms. Ravazzini's presentation. Each local area partner will be contributing about $1.2 million. Uh, and the scope of work in total is about $19 million, some of which is funded uh, by Contra Costa and uh, the local area partners and the remainder fund, funded by U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, wa the Water Commission, carryover of unspent funds and in-kind services from Contra Costa and the local area partners. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the key elements of what the this amendment includes is completing the transition of the JPA administration and financial management over to the JPA. Um, and then also funding the work that was described earlier related to the JPA's adopted budget for this fiscal year, including developing the service agreements that uh, were mentioned and many of the other necessary agreements for accomplishing the project. Uh, modeling work, which there's going to be a lot of <laughs> to develop uh, establishment of operating priorities and allocations and such that you've heard about today. And there's ongoing outreach and, of course, a lot of preparation for the California Water Commission hearing uh, that uh, Tara mentioned is happening next year, and also ongoing project administration and support. So with that, uh, next slide, please. Our next steps, really, uh, that we're looking to kick off tonight would be approval of Amendment Number 5 to the cost share agreement to be able to stay in the game for another year. Uh, and then staff will continue participating in the various work groups to develop the service agreements and, or the service. Yes, it's one agreement that we'll, we will sign our, we would sign ourselves if we participate and uh, many agreements because there are many agencies each that would sign their own uh, and the various other necessary contracts. Um, there's been a lot of activity and I think there's going to be a lot more with staff participating in various work groups and meetings over the coming months to push many of these things uh, that we're discussing forward. Uh, following uh, tonight and this, the continuing work, staff plans to bring future items to the board for consideration, including updates on some of these key agreements and the terms uh, that are reached, updates to the business case as we start finalizing those terms, and ultimately we will be bringing a, a final business case and recommendation on whether to make a long-term commitment, and that would be further down the road. Um, we do have a number of updates planned at committee this fall, just to uh, keep the committee updated on what's happening and, and additional board presentations uh, as, as uh, issues continue to be resolved as well. So th our staff recommendation tonight is on the next slide and that's by motion, authorize the general manager to execute amendment number five to the cost share agreement for Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project Planning with the Contra Costa Water District in an amount not to exceed $1,239,000. So that wraps up our presentation. And I know the board and others may have questions and we're all of us that have spoken today are happy to answer. Okay. So let me take questions from the board first. And I'm going to start from this end with Director Gunther first. We'll go the other Well, direction. I think I've seen what I had to see, um, which is we're not there yet but it's still worth staying in the game. And uh, so that's my position. We're not there yet, but I want to stay in the game. Um, I think we could get there and take some cooperation. Um, but from my point of view, I think we're going in the right direction and everything's a give and take. And uh, I hope the project moves forward. Thank you. Director Akbari. Uh, my my comments are are similar to Director Gunther's. Um, I, I think it's worthwhile for us to continue staying in the game. I think there are clear benefits for <laughs> our district and for our ratepayers, especially um, operationally. I think there's going to be some some benefits that we can avail. So um, I'll be supporting tonight's staff recommendation. Director Wong. Well, same as Director Akbari and Director Gunther. Um, I see this as a cause for us to stay in the game, to keep open the potential of being a partner and eventually be part of the project. I still need to see the business case once we actually get the actual details. But at this point, what's before us is literally a cause to stay in the game and stay participated to ensure however this project comes out, 
at least is something that we could deal with if we choose to participate. I think one thing that Spirit to mention is that I know staff did not put a cost on flexibility, but I think we have all learned in the last few years with climate change, we really do need to look for new storage opportunities, be it San Luis expansion, LVE, but it's a new normal that we need to adapt to. This is something that will keep the door open, could be potentially be a tool for us if it makes sense. So I will be supporting this. Director Weed. Hi, uh, yes, a uh, question I might miss my sir staff. Are we looking at 9,000 acre feet of storage at uh, Las Vicaros? Our, our current request is for 10,000 acre feet. 10, would not 10,000 acre feet at Del Val achieve the same objectives that we're looking at in this chart? We could insert the word Del Val for LVE in your presentation and achieve the same results for the district. And Del Val is built, plumbed, and paid for. I, 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 Director, we, the only way to answer that is just the blunt truth, which is it is, but it, we don't own it and we don't have the ability to operate it in that manner. I know there's desires to look at it and see if we can somehow get into somebody else's space, take over some amount of control and operate the way we want. But the truth is, is we don't have any certitude of that. This is an opportunity before us that as long as we bring some money, we can actually make a reality. Okay. The East Bay Regional Park District 50 year lease is up for renewal at the end of 2024. It's clearly that there's the available storage there that would meet all of the achievements that we're talking about, all the goals that we're talking about spending $50 million for here with this project. It's there, it's there now, and it would certainly be easier to do some transfers. So that was one concern. Next, San Francisco PUC is a major player in uh, Los Vaqueros. I understand they're looking at 40,000 acre feet. Is that correct? Really? Yes, that's yeah. that's the current request for them that, that okay. as for, as part of the 165,000. Yes. Whatever inner tie they have with their system will be done in our backyard. It may well include TP1. In my understanding. I'm concerned that we've had no discussion at this board or I don't know what discussions of any we've had with San Francisco as to how they plan to implement their participation with um, Los Vaqueros. The second aspect of that, could San Francisco substitute Delta water for Hetch Hetchy water once they bring in 40,000 acre feet of um, water from Los Vaqueros? Therefore, we have a major hit on our overall water supply quality. If it were to be delivered through the San Francisco system, uh, perhaps I can just provide um, just about a minute of background. So we have been very engaged with San Francisco on this topic. Well, they're, they're, the issue San Francisco has of participating is how to get it into their system. Uh, the South Bay contractors have worked collectively and ACWD actually took the lead on doing a South Bay Aqueduct capacity assessment or partnering with San Francisco. We did that a number of years ago. The, the biggest volume way for them to get water into their system is to take that South Bay Aqueduct spare capacity, to take that LV water and put it in their San Antonio Reservoir for treatment at their Sonol water treatment plant. They're evaluating that scenario. The other scenario, and really where they started, was actually partnering with ACWD and Valley Water to do exchanges. So we've done a number of studies of our ability to take their surplus surface water and leave behind a fair amount of Hetch Hetchy water, which coincidentally is how we operate right now. We try to minimize San Francisco purchases. So we've done a number of studies. We did those through the bar, actually. We did a, a pilot on that. Uh, Mr. Wunderlich did the financial analysis on that too. So we've done a fair amount of studies together with them. At this point, we've stopped doing that because we need to kind of circle the wagons and take a district specific interest. And so we've told San Francisco for now we need to we need to stop until we get through this next phase of the JPA. All right. Well, as you know, I am skeptical of the benefit to the district of LVE as a dam and water project. I'm strongly supporting the Bethany transfer pipeline. I would like to see it be larger or meet the capacity because I see it as a statewide asset 
not just a local asset within the LVE community. I'm concerned that many of these cost issues could be addressed with the San Francisco intertie and connections. We should be aware of that. And I would note that if we're basing our decisions on what happened in the, in the drought, and the state went to a 0% allocation, I have been told that the DWR has acknowledged the error of their ways and have said they will never again go to a 0% allocation because it prevented the transfers and the 12 years of, 10 to 12 years of reserves we have at Semitropic Drought Reserve. So, I'm worried about the negotiations with the districts. And as I understand the Bartell analysis looked at a reimbursing contra cost of 40% of their cost of building LV1 and 2 adjusted for inflation, which would give them well over 100% reimbursement. Currently their um, rate payers have one of the highest service costs in the state of California because they carried that on their back with the promise that none of the water would go to Southern California. They have not as a board been able to overcome that and on moral principles have denied participation by districts in the um, their Bakersfield. Given that I'm the bait is that I'll abstain, but I, I, do, I feel we have a long ways to go before we can, this thing needs to be, there's no great pressure. There's no criticality. We're going to be shutting down the Los Vaqueros Reservoir for two years. So we can operate for two years without using the reservoir at all. It's not a critical asset in my mind. And, but again, if it can build the uh, transfer pipeline at the maximum size possible. Another alternative, which has not been discussed is Antioch, which has a desalination capabilities. And if that water could be plumbed to the uh, system, Bay and Contra Costa have not gone along historically. Contra Costa is looking at a seasonal water supply as time goes on with the sea level rise. Fortunately, East Bay mud is there to bring in and bring in the water, which Contra Costa will not be able to supply for the better part of the year. So, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I um, support moving ahead with this um, contract amendment. And uh, I'm trying to encourage the other agencies to do so as well as the treasurer of, of the JPA. Um, I've said this before, and I share a lot of the uh, concerns that Director Weed has, but let me just restate what I've said in the past. It's kind of builds on what Mr. Nizar said. The certain certainty that we get from Los Vaqueros Reservoir is not mutually exclusive of pursuing an opportunity um, with the park district at Lake Del Val. And uh, with climate change and everything that's going on, you know, as we're forecasting it into the future, uh, each storage opportunity that we have is critical for uh, our area. And if we are able to free up capacity at Lake Del Val, it's not only uh, to our benefit, but to all three South Bay contractors. So we all have an incentive to try and uh, work with the park district to make something happen. But it it doesn't have the certainty that Los Vaqueros Reservoir has. So I also, you know, uh, have some reservations about not being able to see a clear uh, business case at this point, I would have thought we would have had more progress over the last two years in analyzing the cost benefit and really looking at laying out what ACWD uh, foreseeably would be paying through, let's say 2040, because the, we're not going to get shovels into the ground until next year. By the time we're actually benefiting from this reservoir, it's really in the 2030s up to 2050. And we need to amortize the investment over that period of time. Uh, and I look at that as the short-term horizon. We need to amortize the benefit to the district looking out to the year 2100. 
that I think is the proper way to look at um, a resource like this. And uh, I'm hoping to see that kind of financial analysis in the, in the future. So I will actually uh, move. Oh no, I, I wanna make sure we hear from the public here. <laughs> okay, yeah, don't. I wanna welcome back our audience. And uh, so we'll go with Mr. Kelly A first. Uh, and thank you for your patience. Okay, um, thank you. The, uh, it, it seems like, um, well, just to, to, to buttress or, or support my, uh, um, my earlier statement about um, uh, South Bay Aqueduct uh, or, or seismic reliability and other and engineering reliability, the general managers of Zone 7 of ACWD and of uh, the chief executive of uh, Valley Water all signed a letter five years ago calling for a high priority condition assessment of all sections of that pipeline. So I haven't seen that assessment, but they pointed to numerous uh, problems and weaknesses and uh, and uh, 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 outages. They had like 10 months of outage, blah, blah, blah. It's all, all the details are in their letter. Um, the, uh, the, the benefit, the modeling here that showed an overall cost reduction, I, I don't see, I, I'm completely foggy. I, I don't see what, what were the assumptions that went into that modeling? How much water, when was the water coming in? Was all this water coming in, you know, in, in during the dry season in August? Uh, was it super clean water? Where, where is it being stored? How is this modeling uh, coming up with such a wonderful a net benefit, uh, you know, what are the assumptions that, that went into it that produced such a, a tremendous uh, cost savings overall? And then finally, uh, the cost estimates compare, we now have two agencies with the exact same um, uh, capacity uh, requirement, which is 10,000 acre feet up to 10,000 acre feet in the words of zone seven and 10,000 acre feet in the words of ACWD that we from uh, Los, Vic Los Vicaros expansion. And those those cost estimates we just saw was $3.3 million per year for ACWD, including everything, including capital, including operating, including everything. But over there at zone seven, their participation, their finance people, their number is something like in the, uh, it's a range, but it's around five and a half million dollars, 5.4 million. Um, so that's the, the difference between three and five is uh, for the exact same thing. It looks like on paper um, is uh, uh, that raises uh, that raises my eyebrows that there's a big discrepancy here between what the finance people over there are calling the project cost and what the finance people over here are calling the pro project cost. And I think that one of your finance departments is wrong. <laughs> I don't know which one. But one of them is wrong. Is it uh, three point three or is it five point four? And uh, you have you have the numbers from Zone Seven. I sent you the report uh, yesterday. Thanks. The the numbers may actually be correct on both sides because we're talking about different systems and a different set of investment parameters over at uh, Zone Seven. So. Um, be helpful to have some clarification, but I, I would not be surprised if both sets of numbers are correct. Uh, President Sethi, am yes. I not having seen the Zone Seven report, but hearing those numbers and their familiarity to me? Um, again, I can't speak for sure to the Zone Seven report, but our numbers are kind of deflated into twenty twenty dollars, so they make more sense to to us today. Um, but approximately $5 million is, is about what we would be expecting to spend per year in the 2030s in those nominal future dollars. So it could be just a matter of, uh, of, of inflation and, and what the base here is. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So Mr. Nishimura is also on the line. Could I just Certainly. address one other yes. comment? I, Mr. Brew, I probably should have emphasized this more. What we saw tonight were select slides from a very long presentation from August of 2021. Uh, so there's a lot more detail about this suite of assumptions that went into this analysis. This is really just the summary slides. And maybe I'll just add one more thing, and that is uh, 
I think Mr. Booth's probably right. My guess is both those numbers are wrong because <laughs> they're all estimates based upon lots of assumptions. And you heard about the assumptions that the district had made. Zone 7 may be making a different set of assumptions. We started our presentation with a very bold statement that this is all wrong, uh, but it's the closest that we have right now. We know it will change. Uh, and what's going to really matter is over the next several months, as we start to get those refined numbers, we can um, uh, get a much better picture. So I just want to emphasize again, uh, our number is wrong. <laughs> can I have a request for staff? Sure. So I think Mr. Buru is curious and is wondering about our assumptions. Is it possible to send him a link? I'm sure we have his contact information to the workshop that or board meeting that we specifically gone through long and drawn our assumptions. Yeah, not a problem. We can um, forward to Mr. Abreu more information about that. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Nishimura, did you wish to speak tonight? I don't see your hand up. Going once, going twice. Going Hello. three times. Okay. Oh, there yeah. he is. Oh. Yeah. Um, no, I, I have no comments, unfortunately, uh, due to prior uh, commitments. I have attended this. I joined this meeting late. So um, I don't have any comments at this time on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any members of the audience here that wish to speak up? See none. So I will close the uh, public comments. Come back to the board for any last minute thoughts. I've made a motion to approve the staff recommendation. I'll second that motion. Okay. Thank you. So. Okay. Director Gunther? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Bond? Aye. Weed? Abstain. And Sethi? Aye. So um, I want to thank our guest uh, presenter, uh, the executive director of the uh, Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project. And um, uh, I also want to provide an acknowledgement here because I've been working with uh, uh, or with Tarn or indirectly watching her when she was executive director of the California Water Commission, uh, interim executive. And also with DWR in the past. And uh, uh, when I heard that you were on our um, final list of candidates to be our executive director, I was ecstatic because I knew you based on your past performance and um, you have lived up to every expectation that this new board has had. And until we got on board the uh, program manager Hallmark group from Sacramento, you were doing it all. I don't know how you did it, but uh, thank you for all your good efforts. So um, we will move on. Does anybody want to take a break or should we try to kill these last two items? It looks like we're ready if the board's ready. Okay, item 5.9. Okay, uh, item 5.9 may be of great interest to Ms. Ms. Terzini, Terzini, but may not be. So I just want to acknowledge that she may be leaving as she's got a real long commute uh, this evening on her way back. But again, thank you very much for being here. Uh, item 5.9 is resolution approving fiscal year 23-24 consolidated salary schedule and related salary schedules. And I'll ask our Director of Finance and Administration, Mr. Wunderlich, to kick us off. Great. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. The Board of Directors is required to adopt a resolution approving the fiscal year 23-24 salary schedule that lists the base pay for all district job classifications. Additionally, because the consolidated salary schedule lists the general managers and department director salary ranges, an oral report that summarizes the recommendation is legally required before the board takes action to approve it. The attached consolidated salary schedule is consistent with labor negotiations concluded in 2021 and includes the 3.25% cost of living adjustment uh, for most classifications that was approved through those negotiations to take effect July 1, 2023. The general manager classification was not subject to those negotiations and is not receiving a COLA. 
for employees in classifications paid above market per the 2021 study, their salaries were frozen and they will not receive a COLA until their new salary range catches up to the prior salary range. <laughs> uh, and at this point, actually, um, uh, through the COLA effective July 1 of this year, all but one salary ranges have caught up. Uh, for 2023-24, um, those uh, those employees in those frozen ranges will receive uh, the previously approved lump sum payment in lieu of a COLA. And so approval of this item uh, will help the district achieve its strategic plan goal 3.3, promote financial transparency, and the staff recommendation is by motion, adopt a resolution approving and adopting the attached fiscal year 23-24 consolidated uh, salary schedule and two related salary schedules as described uh, in this report. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions from the board? I'll move the staff recommendation and put it on the table. Second. <clears throat> Directed. Yes. Are there any comments from the public, please? I don't see any hands raised. So we have a motion from Director Weed, second by Director Gunther. Will we please, please take to the roll? Director Gunther? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Juan? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Sethi? Aye. So we'll move on to 5.10. Okay, 5.10 is a resolution to collect delinquent and unpaid charges for owner-occupied single-family residential accounts on the property tax roll. And again, I'll turn it over to our uh, Director of Finance and Administration, Mr. Wunderlich. All right, so the district's collection policy was updated uh, at our January meeting this year to include collecting delinquencies for owner-occupied single-family residential accounts on the property tax roll. Uh, pursuant to the policy, Owner-occupied single-family residential accounts that have delinquent and unpaid charges for water and other services that have been delinquent and unpaid for 60 days or more as of July 1, 2023, are to be assigned to the County of Alameda to collect those amounts on the property tax roll. This item was last reviewed with the Finance and Administration Committee on June 20, 2023, and approval of this item will help the district achieve Strategic Plan Goal 3, improve the district's financial stability, and transparency. Um, I'll quickly just kind of walk through the timeline of some outreach that the district did because this is a first time process for the district that came out of board feedback through workshops we had last year and then the update to the policy in January. Uh, so in March of this year, we sent a letter to nearly 75,000 single family residential property owners informing them, them of this update to our policy. Then on June 1st, we sent a warning notice to 337 accounts representing a total of about 41,000 of past due balances that would be subject uh, to this process. And then we actually received a pretty significant response from those customers with most of them contacting us to, uh, at a minimum, pay the past due balance that would be subject to referral to the tax roll. Uh, in some cases, uh, paying the entire balance, including that that was less than 60 days past due. Uh, and so on July 3rd, uh, the beginning of last week, we sent an updated letter uh, to accounts that continued to be subject to this policy, which was down to only 88 accounts. And in fact, by the time we get to August 1st, when we do the upload to the county portal, I wouldn't be surprised if it's fewer than 50 accounts. Um, because this was a first time process and we wanted to make sure we gave our customers plenty of notice and we weren't totally sure what the response would be to this process, um, staff is looking at the notices we sent June 1st of this year as the baseline. So we would not add any new delinquencies that came uh, became more than 60 days past due over the uh, month of June are not being added, even though legally they could be there, they're not being added. Uh, but given uh, the attention customers paid to this based on that June letter and how many of them uh, responded to us, uh, we are considering uh, for future years that potentially balances that become more than 60 days past due, we would uh, include, again, future years, not this year. Um, and those customers, if that balance becomes more than 60 days past due in the month of June, would still receive the letter 
at the beginning of July and would still have a month to contact us and make arrangements to avoid the referral to the tax roll. And again, uh, that's just based on the response we saw in the month of June. Uh, that's made us feel more comfortable as staff that in, in a future process that um, that notice in July would be sufficient and give folks time, again, just based on the experience we had. So that's just a little background on uh, some of the communication we've done with our customers and some of what we're thinking. Um, but it really, um, I, I think what we've learned is that customers have taken this very seriously and have uh, definitely made arrangements uh, to get current on their bills uh, by and large. And so uh, with that additional overview, the recommendation for this evening is by motion, adopt a resolution to refer delinquent and unpaid charges for water and other services to the County of Alameda for collection on the property tax roll and to take other actions necessary to implement the resolution. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions from the board? Comments? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm supportive of the, uh, the practice of putting, starting to collect delinquencies on the property taxes, getting there. I would hope that we could expand it to all bills, including where we have tenants we currently have that practice, and I would encourage our attorneys to review that and see if we can get clear, you know, if we can get clearance, legal clearance for that. Can we proceed to expand it to the entire customer base? You're referring to renters. Well, yes, to where we have where the um, <clears throat> we have a property owner, and ideally, this would be putting the uh, eventually putting the uh, service charge on the property tax statement. But I see no reason that we have a delinquent tenant, the landlord can be made responsible for that water bill. Particularly, and particularly for the service charge component. But I, I, that needs work and I think we're, we're, we're proceeding. Hopefully we will get to the point where we have zero referrals to collection agencies. No reason to, Pursue that because we write off the entire bill and property taxes get paid. The other aspect, though, is the business decision, business practice. I, my rough estimate is it costs us about $150 an hour for one of our staff to sit there to get involved in trying to proceed with a delinquent collection. That's based on the normal right. Uh, surcharge we charge others in the community for how much our overhead and costs are reflected in the uh, for our own staff when they get our involvement we only had about 27 of these bills i understand were 150 dollars or more that's a relatively small percent number and there is no requirement that we universal we could be selective in when we use this practice of putting it on the property tax and I would hope we would look at our own business cost doing it and do it at a point where it makes financial sense and not worry about the small bills, not spend $150 an hour chasing 10, 15, $20 delinquency. It would be common sense. And I encourage us to do that. It's a um, get into more of a sound business practices as if you were an investor-owned utility and worried about how you were going to spend the money. Thank you. Well, if I, I, I might, I'll, I'll just add to that, that <clears throat> we had a presentation from our collections company down in Visalia, uh, and the um, lady who runs that firm said that we were getting close to 20%, 18 to 20%, uh, satisfaction on chasing down people that were in arrears on their bills and that that was above the industry average of like 13 to 15 percent but when you looked at the cost of engaging that agency it didn't really make sense which is why we first started discussing putting the delinquent charges on the property tax bill and then uh, unfortunately, I missed the last finance committee meeting because I was on the Water Education Foundation tour. And uh, 
but I did note the same thing that we had 337 accounts. You mentioned something like that. Uh, that that's the number that received the first warning letter on June 1st. Right. And, and we were in the low 40 thousands on, on past bills due. So that was working out to a little over a hundred dollars on average. Then I, tried to narrow down what the bill was on those uh, largest bills, and that's where it ran into a few hundred dollars. So I would encourage our finance accounting team to look at the cost of personnel to chase down these hundred dollar outstanding bills. And I mentioned this to, to Director Weed, even though I wasn't at the meeting, I had some input that I felt like we were harassing customers uh, and chasing them down for such a small amount. Sometimes you just need to write off those bills, straight write them off and go after selectively the bills that are the largest. I, I would clarify that a little bit. The bills will still hold, but the requirement is still there. But at what point do you go to the, you spend money seeking the collection? Most bills eventually get paid. Yeah, but when we send them to the collection company, oh, we've, already done, we, we've already done a write-off. Get out of that business entirely. Yes. Yeah, Eliminate so. referrals to collection agencies, which I believe we can do. Well, I'm supportive of that. If I could just clarify, first, our collection agency works on a commission. They retain for their own payment a quarter of what they collect. So there could never be a situation where we're paying them more than they're bringing in because they work on a percentage. Uh, second, we only refer to our collection agency uh, bills or past due bills on accounts that are closed. So this person is no longer a customer of the district. Uh, they don't live here anymore. We would have no ability to use the property tax role uh, to collect on that account as an alternative because they have they have moved on. They no longer have a relationship with the district or with that property. Um, I would argue. And so what I, we're talking I about. Because I believe you, you, you still have a property on it. So it becomes a, you can work your water services agreement. The property owner is responsible for bills that are incurred on that property and that's a change that's a, a paradigm shift in mindset but i believe it's our possibility and i would encourage you to get some legal um clarification on that point if i could just jump in here the the item that's on the agenda is actually the resolution to collect these um to follow the process that the board adopted in revising its collection policy back in january a broader discussion on how to approach other delinquencies or different processes should probably be agendized for a future meeting, and then we can talk about it in more detail. Then I, I would focus here on what's on the agenda tonight. All right. Thank you for that clarification. And, and uh, the fact that we had already passed the policy, <laughs> what we're doing right now is the execution on that policy uh, by submitting to the the county the information that we have so um just a quick question do we have all the parcel numbers that we would be filing with the county yes that's an exhibit attached to the resolution okay other all questions from the board and it's a major step in the right direction so i'll move the uh, staff recommendation and with and discussions later on how we might modify it in the future I'll just add that I would be supportive of agendizing that at some point so we can have a broader discussion on how we want to move forward. Thank you. Me too. Yeah. So do do we have a second before I turn to the public? Oh, uh, I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay. Public comments on this item? Put your hand up, please. There we go. You're up. Uh, <clears throat> President Sethi, um, I must say I'm I'm a little torn on this topic. Um, you know, hearing from Mr. Wunderlich, uh, I am surprised at the response rate that the district received. Um, you know, it's clear that the 
prospect of having one's delinquent bill turned over to the county and the, the property tax system uh, as in, in using the property tax system as a tool to act as a collection device clearly works and you know has much higher response rate than traditional collection agencies and you know from a point of fairness and equity where everybody who has a bill should pay their bill I can see how this is a favorable outcome. On the other hand, you know, and, and maybe this is a, a point that is going to come on the, the proposed agendized item is that we're now balkanizing the way we treat customers. You know, one class of customers is treated in, in a different way than another class of customers. And that also has a philosophical issue. Um, that maybe we can discuss at, at the proposed uh, agendized item in the future. So, you know, given, given the response rate and, and the reaction from the delinquent accounts that have been communicated by Mr. Wunderlich, I will reluctantly support this uh, because it does result in everybody paying their, 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 their bills, which is sort of fundamental to equity across the customer base. And I do also understand and, and, and resonate with the comments that small delinquencies are perhaps not financially worth chasing. On the other hand, you do invite more immoral hazard that if people know that they can be delinquent up to a certain threshold with no consequence, that could cause other problems. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. They're appreciated. So we have a, um, a motion and a second. Could we take a roll call, please? Director Gunther? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Vaughn? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Sethi? Aye. So we will move to. Um, Agenda item six, this is reports and board committee reports. Any comments from anybody on the board? Questions? Anybody from the audience? Seeing none, I will close that portion of the agenda. We'll move on to item 6.2, operational reports. Comments? Okay, if our members of public would not comment, I'm just going to say, looking at the Hartness map, I think this is the only time I could recall that all the entire district is in double digits. Well, I was going to say the same thing. I think this is the best Hartness report I have seen in 15 years. I don't think I've ever seen a report like this. Well, I'll just say while we always the happiest person in the world. Yeah. In the city. Well, I would be, except it probably means we use a lot of hitch hitch. That means you put your hammer away for the summer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention and Mr. Aaron's may want to add, but I think um, we're, we're always trying to improve and strive to do better every day. Um, that means uh, water quality and operationally too. You're right. uh, but uh, there's lots of factors that go into how the uh, the hardnesses came out uh, this last month. Um, and so I, I wouldn't necessarily bank on the same scenario playing out indefinitely. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as uh, former director yeah. Clark Redeker used to complain about, and he was a he had his undergraduate and graduate degrees in chemistry from Stanford. He said, there's a point where the water gets so soft, I can't get the soap off after when I'm taking a shower and then I end up using more water. Yeah. I would like to take uh, you know, credit and credit the yeah. outstanding operations staff for achieving this. But truly, if you look at the TP2 hardness, um, you'll probably never see it this low again. 30s. It's about 31, mm -hmm. which is really just based on the Delta supply. So mm -hmm. the water coming through the Delta right now, uh, probably from the runoff from the heavy winter, just very soft water and it has already started to get a little bit harder so next month the numbers will start creeping up again but yeah this is probably the lowest uh, hardness you will ever see oh, yes. at least we'll probably for a while. give you an achievement award of some kind that's right <laughs> so enjoy <laughs> it this is not gonna last and then yeah you'll take that award back next month <laughs> 
any other comments on on operational reports? Yeah. There, there is. There was a hand up. Uh, it may it may no, have been left over. Here it is. Yeah, I, I was just going to comment on the hardness map as well and 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 marvel at the remarkably low numbers. And I, I believe uh, I got the answer I wanted is the re the reason for why TP2's hardness level is so low. And it's just a, a bolus of very soft water coming down from the snowpack melt. Uh, it is, as others have said, you know, very, very appreciated. But uh, as uh, direct, uh, our general manager Stevenson said, uh, don't, it's something that we can't, uh, count on in the future. But uh, again, uh, it is appreciated. And uh, thank you very much. OK, we'll move on to item 6.3. And this will be a presentation from staff on the recent Capio Epic Awards that were won. That's right, President Sethi. Thank you. You know, um, you know, this is something I had mentioned in a GM report a little while ago. But um, nothing compares to actually seeing the awards themselves and getting a little bit better description about this award program and what this means to ACWD. Uh, nothing beats having staff prepare, especially staff from our public affairs group who's good at this. So I'll introduce Renee Gonzalez, who can share more about uh, this award, what it means to ACWD and how we all received it and, and what, what it was for. Do we have the trophies? We do. we do have the trophies. I'll put them up here. I, I'm going to pass them out. <laughs> yes, thank you, Ed. Well, good evening, ACWD Board of Directors, staff, and members of the public. It gives me great pleasure to present our award-winning entry for the 2023 Capio Epic Awards, Pushing Past Crisis Fatigue, a Water Agency's Call to Using Reverse 911. So what is Capio? Capio is the acronym for the California Association of Public Information Officials, and it consists of more than 1,000 members representing public sector communicators from water, education, police, and city and state government. And the public affairs team of ACWD are all members of Capio. This organization exists to educate and provide networking opportunities that help advance members and their agencies. And our team has benefited from the many, from many professional CAPIO workshops and trainings. So each year, the CAPIO Epic Awards entries are judged based on research, planning, implementation, and evaluation. Uh, the award entries include a two-page narrative, and we submitted ours in March of 2023. The winners were notified in April, and the ACWD Public Affairs team was presented with our awards during CAPIO's award ceremony at the annual conference hosted on May 2nd. And you can see from the program statistics, um, there were 287 entries and 69 winning entries. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you. So our awards entry, Pushing Past Crisis Fatigue, a Water Agency's Call to Action Using Reverse 911, highlighted the challenge of severe drought conditions, a lackluster water conservation rate, and the call to action to reach a 15% reduction in water use system-wide. We focused on raising customer awareness of the drought's seriousness uh, with a team of 11 ACWD staff members across all departments coordinating the effort to deploy the Rapid Alert Notification System, or RANS, in late June. So RANS utilizes a reverse 911 communications technology to inform customers through text, phone, and email. But before we did that, we several factors were considered before we launched our RANS message. So we were careful to word the message to raise awareness and inform customers, but not incite panic. 
And in addition to the time of day and the day of the week were chosen to ensure customers would see the messages. And as you can see, um, we received the awards in two separate categories. The larger award was for the first category, category um, in creative marketing. We received the Epic Award for most innovative communications. And in the second category of communications and marketing process, we earned an award of distinction for crisis communications response. So utilizing RAMS to raise customer awareness about the drought resulted in a phenomenal outcome. We were able to meet our goal. Our award entry il illustrated the impact of the RAMS campaign to the Capio judges and the public affairs team is proud to say that using RAMS and his effectiveness is now part of an award-winning communication campaign. And that's it. There we are. We accepted our board there at the um, annual conference in May. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Are there any questions? I have a comment. So I happened to walk into Shireen's office when I saw these awards sitting on her desk and I became curious and I have been familiar with Capio over the years. Um, and so I went to the website when I got home for Capio to learn more about each one of these awards. And I looked at all the other agencies and it is extremely rare for one organization to win uh, one award, let alone two awards uh, for the same campaign. And so I came away with uh, uh, a much deeper understanding of uh, the competition that you were up against and really the significance of this achievement. So um, you all deserve uh, accolades for, for what you've achieved here. Thank you so much. It was definitely a team effort. Yeah. And happy to achieve our goal of meeting the 15% water um, reduction system-wide. We're going to hold you up to a higher standard next year. <laughs> <laughs> We're already planning for our next entry for next year's um, awards. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yes. I, I sat on the LICA committee for several years now, and I've mentioned this in that committee, but I think it needs to be restated here. I think we have some really, really excellent leadership in our public affairs staff. And so I really commend you all. You guys have a lot of ingenuity. You, you really understand our customer base um, and can help us uh, extend messages to them in a way that uh, I think we, we just do a lot better than other districts. And so I, I really commend you all on, on this achievement. And I'm very, very thrilled to, uh, to continue seeing all the work that we get to do with you all. Thank you. And I think I'll just pile down. I am also lucky enough to be sitting on the like a community and every month the amount of staff that in outreach is tremendous, the amount of work and the creativity of the team. Hey, we have a Spotify channel. Come on. Um, we might be the only water district, come think of it. Um, but anyway, the creativity, the ingenuity, and just the fact that you understand our customer base and know how to talk to our customers and share information and encourage them. That work is undervalued, but really appreciated by the board. Thank, Thank you. you. So we do have some employees here, and I think it's deserving that we have some applause here. No, <laughs> right? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. <clears throat> so we're down to general manager's reports. I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to do my blog for staff to report on this board meeting about applause in the boardroom for an item. I, <laughs> I'm not sure we get that often uh, other than like the student video contest. Oh, I've <clears throat> got a couple of quick GM reports, one, just mostly to uh, let you all know that I'm um, meddling with your peers, uh, uh, legislators in the, uh, out there. One is at President Sethi's request, 
Uh, I've been coordinating with um, Congressman Swalwell's office related to opportunities for federal funding related to PFOS. Um, this would be above and beyond our other efforts related to uh, um, grant um, funding applications and so forth. And so I just, just want you to know that in case you happen to run into Congressman Swalwell or others um, looking at seeking a federal community project funding um, uh, request through the office. And so far, uh, it seems optimistic. We've got a little ways to go. Also coordinating with Assembly Member Lee's office related to a tour that he's requested of our fish passage facilities. He's been interested for a long time, wasn't able to stick around during our ribbon cutting ceremony and, and, and hasn't been able to make other um, options work. So we're working with his office right now to see if we can provide that tour. Uh, once we have a date for that, um, I'll let the board know too, in case you um, are available, want to stop by, um, anything along those lines. So also coordinating with Aqua Region 5 on the Region 5 program uh, this year, this coming fall. Um, the, the tour right now, and it's still being finalized fast and furious, would be a tour of ACWD's fish passage facilities, uh, Quarry Lakes recharge area, and also the Newark desalination facility. They got a real aggressive uh, program. They want to try and get everything. Uh, uh, Director Avila over at Contra Costa um, on the Region 5 board was uh, hoping to be able to see all of that in one day. And so we're working hard to make it happen. Um, right now that is set up for September 21. And based upon my uh, conversations with, um, with Aqua, uh, they should be ha uh, should be seeing some things go out pretty soon in terms of save the dates and uh, RSVPs and so forth. I originally committed to that date. Uh huh. Uh, You're supposed which, to speak, which is Thursday. Uh huh. But uh, I have to be in Sacramento for the Delta Conveyance Finance Authority meeting. Okay. All right. So I will not be able to be there. Okay. Well, maybe uh, we'll see whether Director Gunther may be available to say a few words. If not, it's okay. And maybe other directors would like to participate. Um, but it's on September 21. It'll be pretty much an all day thing. So if you'd like, mark your calendars now, but you'll see stuff coming out from Aqua and we'll be sure to Is forward there a that. Friday to you. session too? Not for this one. Okay. Yeah. No, this is just the 21st. You is everybody ending up at a winery? No, no, we have lunch at Quarry Lakes. That's the closest thing we get to special uh, venues. Given this, the breadth of Region 5 going all the way down to Ventura, we often had a separate uh, reception the night before. We had to have, in order for some districts to get reimbursed for their that day, had to have some type of a program built with that reception. Uh, is that in the plan or is it just a one? -day? It's not anything that Aqua has brought up. Um, certainly ACWD hasn't brought, brought it up. We're mostly concerned with how do we get buses around? <laughs> so, um, so that hasn't been brought up, Director Weed. And some bridges learned their, their air, <laughs> the cost of uh, picking up the tab. I, I certainly <laughs> wouldn't speak for our friends at Hanson Bridget. <laughs> okay. Um, just also a reminder, there's all kinds of outreach and public engagement opportunities coming up over the next uh, weeks and months. Um, you received an email from Shereen Gonzalez. Feel free to let us know if you're interested in participating or attending in any of those. Um, if you'd like, I can resend it. Um, and, and by the way, more are being uh, considered and added all the time. It's a real busy outreach and engagement season. Um, I think we have one final last minute hot off the presses uh, general manager's report that um, I hope Mr. Wonderlick is ready to deliver. I, I am ready. So I'll, I'll just uh, read the press release because uh, really did just come off the presses this afternoon. <clears throat> the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada has awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting to Alameda County Water District for its annual comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year ended June 30, 2022. The report has been judged by an impartial panel to meet the high standards of the program, which includes demonstrating a constructive spirit of full disclosure to clearly communicate its financial story and motivate potential users and user groups to read the report. 
The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by a government and its management. Now, I did not double check before coming to the meeting because uh, we really did just get this at like, you know, four or five o'clock this afternoon, uh, the official notice. But I believe this marks uh, either the 23rd or 24th year in a row of being recognized by GFOA. That coincides with uh, the <laughs> tenure of two directors here and three directors. So, so um, well, congratulations, Mr. Wunderlich, and to the entire team. Thank you. When we see the trophy, we'll give you an applause for your team. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, there's no trophy. We uh -huh. have a plaque in a conference room down uh, on the wing of the building where we're all situated. And what we get is a little uh, kind of circular medallion, medallion with the year to attach to it. And you can put like 10 years on each plaque. So that's okay. that's what we have. No, no special trophy each year. All right. I've got two reports to give, but could we start at the other end of the board if there's any reports? Um, there was a presentation at the Bosca uh, Policy Committee meeting in San with San Francisco PUC on their alternative wa uh, water supply. And I understand they released it as of the end of June. It may, hopefully, it's under a comment period. San Francisco has identified two reservoir projects, four versions of uh, Calaveras, Los Vaqueros, four recycled water projects, one of which is the Alam Alameda County Water District, USD. This is a 20-year plan. Conspicuous by its absence is any reference to desalination. They have a 92 million, a million gallon per day gap still that they still have to find. I made the point at the policy committee meeting that really recycled water is a base supply. It's not an alternative or alternate water supply. It keeps coming. You build your cost on top of that. But we had evaluated the project that had been part of the bar pro uh, program and determined it to be six to $8,000 an acre foot, three to four times the cost of current water, uh, San Francisco water, and had put it on the end. And while we've kept it in our C a CIP, which hopefully be reworded to include desal. It's outside the scope, the 20 year scope that uh, San Francisco is using for its alternate water supply. Um, it's remarkable that San Francisco is bought into a anti immigrant um, no desal policy as, an, as a city and entity. So thank you. Nothing for me. Let me build on. Uh, Director Weed's comments. Um, for over a dozen years, I've been on the Fremont Chamber of Commerce uh, Government Affairs Committee. And um, <clears throat> this past month, at the end of June, we had two of uh, the governor's uh, lieutenants that were presenting to us for about an hour and a half. And we talked uh, about this strike task force that the governor has set up for these water issues and where we're going with trying to clear the hurdles on, on minimizing the amount of time that you can go to court on CEQA actions. <clears throat> and um, at the last minute, uh, the Delta conveyance uh, was left out of the, the budget. So uh, I mentioned to them that we heard the governor's um, announcements last October in his uh, water strategy report, we took those seriously. And he asked for um, proposals for a number of things, including desalination, uh, not only in coastal areas, but inland. And uh, that <clears throat> we were going to try to get a proposal in by the end of the year for at least maybe one or two ideas of what could be studied in our jurisdiction. And uh, I said that we have the only brackish water desal plant in all of Northern California. And both of them were astounded. They go, why? 
what's going on? And I had to explain to them that every time a desal plant is proposed anywhere in the Bay Area, the environmentalists want to kill it. And they do their best because they don't want additional growth. Desal was once again for like the fourth time in four decades being considered in the recent drought up at Marin Municipal. And the environmentalists stormed the boardroom meetings. The same thing happened in Santa Cruz. They killed a project down there and in Pajaro Valley. Um, and I told them that the governor's going to have to provide much more funding incentives to get through these environmental uh, blockades. This is all led by the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, Trust for Public Lands. You saw what happened down in Hunting, Huntington Beach when the California Water Commission with a lot of appointees from Governor Brown and Governor Newsom killed that project when there's already been a billion dollars of investment um, and just absolutely killed it. These are, we have to have desal moving forward in this state, especially uh, brackish water desal because it's our lowest cost of water. And I told them that they were surprised to hear that too, that it's our lowest cost of water supply for our district. So um, we are in a tough battle with the environmental groups and I'm gonna get to more of it in my next report here. So uh, we're going to have another meeting at the end of July with two other representatives from the governor's office, and we'll be talking about water and other issues again. So I'm going to make my report on Los Fiqueros Reservoir brief because you heard most of where we are uh, on terms of uh, progress, and you saw the timeline moving forward. Um, a lot of work has been accomplished. I'm reporting on both the meeting in June and the one board meeting we had yesterday at Zone 7. And uh, just to cite a few things, we selected an accounting firm. We approved our audit policy yesterday. And we're going to go out for bids on an auditor, a new auditor. We're using an interim one right now. And uh, we got our bank as Bank account set up last week. Uh, first check came in from Contra Costa of 1.425 million. And as and we got our, um, I'm the primary signatory on the checks that are going out as the treasurer, which is kind of cool. And uh, Taran is the uh, uh, back, backup signatory. So we're expecting to have tens of millions of dollars flowing in. We still have money coming in from the Bureau of Reclamation and the California Water Commission. So um, we're looking good right now, as long as all of the current eight board agencies that are participants uh, make their Amendment 5 contribution for this, this current fiscal year that we're in. Water Education Foundation, I'm going to send down some slides here. This was the tour over two days to visit the um, three watersheds, the American River watershed, the Feather River watershed, and the Yuba watershed. <laughs> and um, we had an overnight stay in South Lake Tahoe and the next day went up to uh, Incline Village to go to the UC Davis uh, uh, research facility there, and you may have seen some of the news that came out of that uh, that research lab this past week that we have the best clarity in the lake in 35 years. Um, it's always fascinating to go there. It's, I think, my fourth time um, that I've been there. And we also visited the UC Berkeley uh, research station on the way up in the American River watershed. I have driven up to South Lake Tahoe my entire life since I was a child with my parents. It's, I've always considered it one of the most beautiful scenic highways in California. 
that doesn't get beaten up, you know, with truck traffic like Highway 80. And the, the Calder fire that occurred last fall burned a million acres of land. And it is unrecognizable. Highway 50 looks like a war zone. It's just totally unrecognizable. It will not return to its beauty for another hundred years. I'm sure of it. And um, we had some serious discussions with uh, listening to opposing points of view views from the environmental organizations. Um, and the logging industry, as well as people that are trying to manage our water and, and snowfall, snowpack. And with the devastation of all these forests, the quality of water, the rate at which snowpack is melting, all of these things are becoming an issue. And I've been on this tour once before, several years ago with Director Weed. And for the first time I heard uh, a turning point, especially with the top environmental groups, because they're coming to their senses finally that by trying to save one spotted owl, they're not clearing the forest properly like the Native Americans did. And we are building up so much fuel that you get one lightning strike and then your forest is wiped out and you no longer have a place for the spotted owl or the wildlife, other wildlife that lives in the forests. So um, we used to have 600 lumber mills in California a century ago. We had um, dozens and dozens, a hundred, um, just a couple of decades ago, we're down to six lumber mills in California in the state's fourth largest economy. And the cost of trucking timber to a lumber mill is now so prohibitively expensive, the best they can do is just try to masticate the wood as best they can and, and, uh, and spread it around. But that in itself is fuel too. So we're watching the devastation of our forests. I'm expressing an opinion here, but it was shared by a lot of the folks from the water industry that um, we're, we've been in a 50, 60 year fight with the environmentalists that have essentially put our forest systems into critical danger. And we don't have the resources to pull out the underbrush, do more logging. They're looking at new strategies like for biogas and things like that, uh, biogas satellites, where we could um, turn the, the wood into some other useful products. But each watershed right now is in just absolute devastation. And, you know, the, we were at the confluence of the Sacramento and American River on one stop, and <clears throat> and you know we get our forty percent of our water here from from Lake Oroville down through the Feather River watershed, and that watershed is um, having a lot of forestry mismanagement and um, trees to the being devastated and then down through the Yuba uh, watershed as well. So we've got quite a problem on our hands as a state and the headwaters are extremely important. That's where we get all of our, most of our water in the Northern Sierras and coming down here. So I've always considered myself an environmentalist. I belonged to the Sierra Club for a long time until I realized that most of my money is going to pay for high-priced attorneys. I drag everything out in court for years and years and years, and that there is absolutely no compromise. There's no ability to negotiate. Here are the people's opinions and compromise. 
And now we as a state are paying the price for what I see as um, the environmental groups holding the citizens of California hostage and leaving us in this limbo. I'm sorry to be on my soapbox, but uh, I think all of us felt very emotional emotionally when we got back and we were sitting down to share some of our our thoughts about what we had seen it's just you shake your your head and you go how, how did we end up here it's really sad so uh and this is why we do not see the environmental groups at the association of california water agencies they will not attend they are the enemy they view us as the enemy so they simply do not show up um so that concludes my remarks and i will turn it over to our general counsel oh yeah sorry thank you for the reminder yesterday at the lve board meeting we approved a resolution in support of senator feinstein's stream act senate bill 2162 other water districts around the Bay Area have also passed resolutions in favor of this. Senator Feinstein is having the next key hearing next week on July 19th, and she is soliciting, trying to solicit as much support as possible going into that meeting. And uh, as we discussed it yesterday, we're not aware of any uh, district that is opposed among the members that are in the LVE JPA. And that is because this STREAM Act is providing additional funding, $750 million. And we're one of the few projects in the nation that is on the short list that has received, uh, is receiving WIFIA uh, money from the EPA plus money from the Wind Infrastructure Act and, uh, you know, all the complimentary funding from the California Water Commission and, and Bureau of Reclamation. So they have an expedited procedure for those projects that have already gotten to that level. And, and this is where this money would go. So we're in a very pri privileged position. I was going to have this put on the agenda for next month, but it would be very nice if there was concurrence on the part of the board that we gave instruction to our general manager to get a letter out um, early next week uh, to the senator's office expressing support. And so I am asking here if I have that support from the rest of the board. You're welcome to read what the act is. It's in here. I, I support the uh, your efforts, uh, but there, as I recall, there's a provision in the Stream Act where they define economically disadvantaged using an IRS code, and I encourage us to review that uh, provision and see how it meshes with uh, um, our own policies. My question is more regarding procedure for council. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm anticipated that, and I did have a discussion with the general manager before this. We're not asking for board action on this. Really, the the um, my understanding is that your general manager was going to submit a letter of support and wanted to just be sure that there was no objection from the board before he did that, and that there is objection, state so now. Otherwise, he will proceed to submit that letter. Perfect. Thank you. No objections. <laughs> um, I might uh, briefly under items to the board. I passed out an item that showed up today on the internet related to um, a study by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and BCDC on the impacts of sea level rise. What I found of interest is the chart they showed, which started to document what they used for their guidelines. They used 1.7 feet in the, for the year 2050. Then they said the state came in and somehow arbitrarily made it 3.5 feet. So if you read the text, and then you put a storm on top of that. So trying to come up with an actual quantification of what sea level rise will be. It also comes into play 
with the sites reservoir, we had a presentation earlier today from Jerry Brown at the um, South Bay Engineers Club saying they didn't need Delta conveyance because they were going to use N Delta uh, throughput and drop the water off at Knight's Landing, which is maybe 15 miles north of uh, Woodside and uh, Davis. And we'll see the water transfer through the Delta. The Delta master has said that if they get two feet of sea level rise, we've lost the Delta. So um, we're not involved in sites, Valley Water and Zone 7R. I would encourage us to keep our current position. Thank you. But just to build on that, uh, tonight there was a concurrent meeting going on down at the Fremont Senior Center in which we were participating with the three cities and USD on the hazard uh, mitigation uh, strategy for the our three our South Bay communities. And um, it was a, a report came out today. You'll probably see it on the front pages of the newspaper tomorrow on television that San Francisco, a, a study on defending San Francisco against sea level rise is going to cost 110 billion between now and 2050. So if you have to uh, protect the entire interior of the Bay Area, you're talking about at least a trillion dollars. And uh, I have expressed concern before about new housing developments that are <clears throat> have been built close to the shoreline in Newark recently that would certainly be under water and already have where we already have a very high water table to begin with, as well as over by Patterson Ranch. So um, I think people, councils want the property tax revenue so desperately that they are willing to push off into the distant future um, their obligation to protect their own cities. Fortunately, Fremont has a, a floodplain that we're, we're not going, building into right now. But um, it makes me really nervous when I see, I grew up in this community. I don't like it when I see that we are making poor decisions on land use planning only for the quick buck that's in front of us. You say fortunately Fremont. As my understanding, Will Travis from the BCDC came to the city of Fremont workshop, left saying it was one of the most difficult meetings he'd ever attended and discouraged. BCDC, which is required by the state to come up with a 100 foot um, mark around the bay, is developing it for Alameda County from the southern border of Union City to Emeryville. Fremont is not was not participating and probably is not to this day. Yeah, and former council member and state assemblyman, state senator, Bob Wykowski, uh, I was with him at the meetings a couple of times up in San Francisco where he was one of the commissioners on that, that body. And... Uh, in talking to him more recently about the very same set of circumstances you're talking about, he was almost grievous. Like, what in the world is our city, what are our city officials doing? They don't want to step up for the responsibility because of the cost obligation and the fact that Fremont is 100 square miles. And yet we do have to plan for the defense of the shoreline. I'm sorry I can't be down there at that hazard mitigation meeting tonight because folks need to rise up and say, why is Fremont not a participant? Flooding is a, has a potential hazard. On a potentially positive sign, Fremont is actually working with Alameda County Water District and the cities of New York and uh, Union City, where last time, five years ago they refused to and just kept it as a close hold and um, chose to ignore a number of issues. Well, that was the shoot. If I can just, this is a very important topic and maybe we should agendize it for a future meeting. Okay, you got it. Thank you. You're the boss. <laughs> All right, so um, I did start off by asking if our general counsel could move us into 
closed session. Great, and I'm happy to do that. It's now nine o'clock and the board is gonna convene into closed session pursuant to California Government Code section 54956.9 subsection D1. Conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, name of the case, Alameda County Water District versus 3M Company et al. Case number 222-AV-55555-CIV, dash dash MDL number 2873. We can now convene into closed session. So I didn't hear any objections to sending out a support letter? No, no send it. Like okay, great. 10. We're resuming our meeting at 1054. And I'm going to turn it over to our general counsel to report out what happened in our closed door session. Right. It's, it's 954. Oh, 954. Um, Sorry. Yes. That's okay. And uh, the board convening closed session pursuant to California Government Code Section 54956.9, subsection D1. Conference of Legal Counsel, existing litigation, name of the case, Alameda County Water District versus 3M et al. Case number 222-AV55555-CIV, 55555 uh, MDL number 2873. And in the closed session, no action was taken. And that concludes the open session report. Thank you, Mr. Miyake. And if there's no other business here before the board, I will call the meeting adjourned at 955. Hope you get better. Thank you, Paul.